bespoke radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. All right, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? I'm hanging out in Twitter chat room having fun but i'm here how you doing it's fade to black yeah bespoke radio for the masses today is tuesday tuesday february 22nd 2022 not gonna happen for another 200 years we got to wait because it's only 53 days into the new year. we got 312 days left and another 221 years to go. We are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of nowhere. A total undisclosed location. But it is beautiful in here. Yeah, man. You have no idea. You got a little bit. You got this much of an idea. That's, that's, yeah, you got that much. You got that much of an idea. That much. Man, you got this much of an idea. It's nice. I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer, and on next networks. I'm yours, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? In addition to today being 2-22-22, got a ring to it, or Tuesday, it's uh, also Taco Tuesday, and it's also National Margarita Day. Wow. So it's not 2-22-22, it's like 3 for 2 22 2 22 Think about that for a second. Pretty cool. Pretty amazing day. <sighs> Somebody said to me um, over the weekend, or last weekend, not this week, the weekend before, I said, Jimmy, let's have margaritas. Break out your blender. And I said, I don't got one. And uh, and and the response was immediate. I mean, it was global. It was, it was every. It was unity. It was like, what do you mean you don't have a blender? Everybody's got a blender. I said, I don't. I don't have a blender. So what are we going to do about margaritas, Jimmy? I said, I guess we're not unless I'm driving to the store right now at midnight. I don't have a blender. And I still don't. Still don't. I gotta work on that. I gotta I gotta work on that. Do they just make well, you know what? I need I need it for two things. So I think I need two so I think I need like a margarita maker. Is that called a blender or is there a separate specialized device? Or is it just a blender? I don't know. But then shakes. I want one of those shake machines. You know, it's got the thing that comes down and it's not a blender. It's a shake thing. And you got the steel cup 
and you pop that baby in there and you make sure. See, I need it for two. I, I need two specialized devices. I need a margarita maker and I need a shake maker. But it is National Margarita Day. All right. 22222. That's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. That's got a certain ring to it. And it does feel different because tonight on the show, Freddie Silva is here. Yeah, man. Freddie Silva is here. And uh, it's going to be um, uh, an amazing conversation tonight. And his research and his knowledge about cultures in deep ancient history uh, through to today. Tonight, tonight we're going to be we're going to be going far back. Um, but to have conversations uh, with Freddie about this subject, because I just like to I just like to go, you know, and I like to learn and and, and share knowledge. We're going to be doing that tonight with Freddie and uh, possible ET contact with the ancients in far, I'm saying far, far ancient history. So we're going to be doing that tonight and uh, tomorrow night right here. John Greenwald. We're going to be talking about that NSA report that uh, certainly has stirred up the web uh, just a little bit. You think just a little bit, just a little bit. We're going to be talking about that and so much more tomorrow night. John posted. John uh, uh, posted something else uh, today about the FBI and Bigfoot. And I'm going to talk to him tomorrow night about this too as well. And very interesting. And he posted, and you can check it out. You can go to blackvault.com uh, or go to his Twitter page and you'll see his post there. The post was about um, the FBI. I believe it was the FBI. Uh, got a hair sample, a Bigfoot hair sample, had it tested in the lab and released a report saying that this did not come from any humans or any animals on this planet, right? And then, and he got the documents, and now the documents don't exist. What? Yeah, right? Check it out. Check out uh, John's new article. Okay. So we're going to be talking about that tomorrow night, too, as well. There's no way I can let that go. Thursday is another fader night. With open lines all night long. Oh, look at that. Need a blender with some horse. Oh, now see, I like that. <laughs> Gas powered blender. That's cool. That looks like it's functional and real. That's pretty cool. That's not decoration. That's the real deal right there. All right. Follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. I was on Twitter. Um, before the show, my new hashtag that I just started is right here. And, uh, the hats are real FTMF. That's right. That's right. FTMF hashtag FTMF. You know, when Twitter just, you know, Twitter, social media, and you just got somebody, ee, ee, you know, some some doofus, you know, just, ee, ee, and, you know, and you're just like, man, you know, uh, uh, hashtag FTMF, FTMF, make the world a better place. That's all you got. to You'll feel so much better. It's cleansing. Oh, I'm, I'm over it. I've moved on. FTMF. That's what you, I mean, just uh, 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 FTMF. That's it. That's it. Just make the world a more beautiful place. I'm doing my small part, and you can do yours. Hashtag FTMF. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I had these hats made, and uh, very special hats. Before you go, I want one, Jimmy. Send me one. Ain't going to happen. No, 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 no. But you're going to see them popping up in social media. I guarantee you. All right? Because I've already sent my first one out today. Who did it go to? Somebody that just needs to... FTMF. <laughs> Uh, FTMF, hashtag FTMF. All right. 
Follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. The sandbox is hashtag F2B on Twitter. I'm going to send one of these. Race Hobbs would look good in this hat. Wouldn't race this? This hat was made for Race Hobbs. That's a Race Hobbs hat right there. Race Hobbs deserves one. FTMF. At J Church Radio. That's what you want to do. What? Somebody beat me to it? Uh, okay. Oh, man. Okay. Somebody beat me to the hashtag. Ah, oh. uh, but it's for a fire department. What is that? And uh, that's pretty cool, though, actually. That's pretty funny. What does it say? How about them dogs? FTMF. Would love to know. Uh, I would love to know what that's what that's about. That's actually pretty funny. Okay, let's move on. Got a lot to do tonight. Breaking news. Proco Harem's Gary Brooker, singer and co-author of A Wider Shade of Pale, died Saturday of cancer. He was 76 years old. That is truly, truly one of the greatest songs in all of music history right there. Gary Brooker. Rest in peace, man. For the first time ever, scientists have recorded the activity of a dying human brain, discovering that it showed the same patterns as seen during dreaming. Memory recall and meditation. Findings published in the journal Frontiers in Aging Neuroscience Today showed the recording of the activity in an 87-year-old patient who had been connected to an EEG machine to detect seizures and treat the patient when he suddenly had a heart attack and passed away. The 900 seconds of brain activity that were measured around the time of the patient's death were described as being similar to a life recall. That's in quote. That is in the journal. Researchers indicated the findings mean that the brain remains active and coordinated as the individual passes away and even after their death. Wow. Wow. I'm going to leave that right there. Sea ice in the Antarctic has fallen to its lowest level since records began 40 years ago, according to data from satellites. The new measurements show it has surpassed the previous record minimum set in March of 2017 of 810,000 square miles. It has now dropped to 765,000 square miles two days ago on February 20th. The situation is so dire that the ice is now dwindling three times faster than in the 1990s. That's right. Contributing to... A rise in global sea levels. Wow. Well, the U.S. Department or the U.S. Copyright Office has rejected a request to let artificial intelligence copyright a work of its art. Last week, a three-person board reviewed a 2019 ruling against Stephen Thaler, who tried to copyright a picture on behalf of an algorithm he dubbed Creativity Machine. The board found that Thaler's AI-created image didn't include an element of human authorship. That's right. A necessary standard, it said, for protection. So your dog creates... A piece of art, right? Your dog, <clears throat> a monkey with a paintbrush, can't be copywritten. Wow. Wow. It didn't say it had to have a pulse. It said human authorship. All right, I just had to share this. This next thing, I laugh so hard, and so will you. Kanye West has been banned from appearing on Saturday Night Live in the future. <laughs> Just outright banned amid his very public meltdown and crazy post attacking the sketch show and several of its cast members, including Pete Davidson. Everybody loves Pete Davidson, right? What do you got against Pete? Well, 
Why has Kanye lost what's left of his mind? It's a great question, right? And the answer is Pete Davidson is dating Kanye's ex, Kim Kardashian. And the final blow, right? The death blow, the final blow, Kardashian and her sisters, Courtney, Chloe, Kendall, and Kylie, those are all K's. Those are all K's. Courtney, Chloe, Kendall, and Kylie have unfollowed Kanye on Instagram and are now following Pete. <laughs> oh, the drama. When you're a billionaire, Kanye's a billionaire. When you're a billionaire, you're really checking who's following and unfollowing you on Instagram, X and her sisters or not. Really? You would think you'd be a little bit busier. Man, I got to leave town. I leave town to goof around, and I'm not on social media for three days. I don't even think about it. And if I'm winging, if I'm in my G5, it's for him, it's his 747, and flying around the world, shopping and visiting and, and touristy things and and vacationing, and because he don't work, you know, and just out goof. Instagram. There you go. I just cracked up. What a waste. All right. Let's get this show cracking. Happy birthday to today. Drew Barrymore is 47. Cat's eye E.T. Donnie Darko. Loudness. Roudness. Loudness. Guitar God. Akira Takasaki. Akira Takasaki. Today. Is 61. I watched me some loudness videos today. You know I did. Hey, hey, hey. Wong, wong, wong. All right, man. Akira Takasaki, 61 years old. Jason Quit says today he is 29 years old. Happy birthday, Jason Quit. Spiracy Quit. We got to do a Quit Spiracy show. I'm about ready for that. All right. Our dead guy's birthday today is. Robert Wadlow, 1918 to 1940, died at the age of 22. Robert, born in Illinois in 1918, grew up to be the tallest person in recorded history, as in ever. By the time he was just 22, he was 8 foot 11.1 inches tall. Let me say that again. Eight foot 11.1 inches tall. And he was still growing. When he died, he was still growing. There were no signs that he was done. He was still growing. On July 4th, 1940, at the Manistee National Forest Festival, a faulty brace irritated his ankle. He wore leg braces. Yeah, you got to do that when you're eight foot 11, leading to an infection. He was treated with a blood transfusion and surgery, but his condition worsened, and he died in his sleep July 15th, like five days later. He was just 22 years old. Wow. Happy birthday, Robert. Incredible, incredible. His, his life was just incredible. All right. On this day in history, 2014, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, the world's most wanted drug kingpin is captured in Mexico. Man, that was just in 2014. Crazy. Fader fact. All right, here's... Okay. Stay with me. In 1997, David Bowie sold asset-backed securities called Bowie Bonds, which gave investors a share in his future royalties for 10 years. That is your fader fact. You got yourself a Bowie bond? That's a, that's a great fader fact. <sighs> River Moon Coffee. Rivermoonwellness.com. Yeah. River Moon Wellness. Fade to black blend. That's what I'm talking about. Best coffee in the world. That's right. Hashtag F2B blend will get you 15% off of your order today. It is 
You have no idea what the, what, man. Mm. Some of you do, though. Some of you fully. Margaritas on the rocks. Yeah, I know. I thought about that. I thought about that. And uh, you're right. You're right. What is going on here? True Barrymore. <laughs> is that from Donnie Darko? That looks like it. I see the school. Oh, it's a taxi. I thought it was a school bus. All right. So I, uh, so I, uh, so I finished the new season of Space Force last night. Have you seen it? Have you watched it? It is out. It's right there. It's Netflix. That's right. It's pretty good. And after, and I was pretty tired too. Um, it was kind of early. I think I, I needed to pop off three episodes, 30 minutes each. You know, not, not that big of a deal. So I had to pop off three and uh, then head to bed, which I did. And then I had the craziest dream. Now, and you know, dreams, dreams are a weird thing. Do you want to hear about somebody else's dream? <sighs> not really. You know, but your dreams are the most important dreams in the world. I get that. I know mine are. But I'm going to share this with you. The dream was about the Big Bang. But it wasn't the bang that you might be thinking of. Uh, but I did wake up at 4 a.m. And, and I know that it was 4 a.m. because I woke up and my lamp was still on. I'm a low setting, but it was still on. Normally I turn that off and I'm in the dark. But I, I don't know how that happened. But it did. And uh, and I and I looked down and there it was. It was like four a.m. Right at the end of the dream, and I was deep in it, deep man. And I woke up out of the dream and remembered everything. Was it Space Force? I don't know. I'll let you decide that. But um, I'm just going to, without boring you with the whole dream and and all of that stuff, cast of. You know, whatever, boring. So then I'm walking through the house and then all the way down to the basement and then I'm going to, you know, and up these stairs. No, 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 we're not going to do that. But this was what the dream was about, where I was arguing with um, a bunch of scientists about the beginning of the universe. And my presentation, which was um, uh, a PowerPoint, uh, presentation, which was part of Space Force. And when you watch Space Force and you see that there's a PowerPoint episode and and there you go. So I'm going to lay – so that, I think that's the tie-in with Space Force. But I'm doing this PowerPoint presentation in front of these things. I think it's like at the United Nations or something. There's a big room and a big stage, and I got this podium, and I got the, the screens in back of me. And what I presented was that there wasn't a big bang – it was more like a big, right, where these different bubbles were all created at the same time like a bubble machine. And, uh, and all were universes. And they all happened at the same time. <laughs> It was just the right, and and that and that was my presentation, and that we were one universe. That it wasn't a big bang; it was just a chemical reaction, and and this just like a bubble machine. <laughs> that was my presentation, bubble machine, and 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 that's what happened. There was no big bang; it was a big and. Uh, and I'm trying to, and everybody's like getting up and yelling and and calling me names. And I think that's part of what uh, started the FTMF, by the way. But anyway, um, uh, I couldn't convince, and I thought, and this is always, you know, what your dreams are about. I thought it was the greatest idea ever. And this was the answer to everything. And of course, it was the multiverse and it was this and then and this and this. But that, uh, and this is how it happened. There wasn't a big bang. It was just a bunch of little bubbles that were created. And, 
and 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 took off. And uh, and then I had this other uh, another part to this. I'm going to squeeze this in that um, there was this question that came up, and this was like at the end of the dream um, when when I woke up, and the question came up. Well, wait a minute, how big were these bubbles? And I was like, you know. Uh, baby universe they were huge well wait a minute so how many were and i said look when you're looking at them like this the distances that you're thinking about and the size of everything that you're thinking about doesn't matter because if you take if you were a giant and you reached out and you grabbed one of these bubbles and moved it over you may be moving it a trillion to the power of 10 miles, but to your hand, you're just moving it a quarter of an inch. And they were like, oh, stop. And it just laughed me off of the stage. And that was my counter argument, was that if you were a giant <laughs> grabbing the bubbles and moving them, it's not a big distance. And the, and the universes aren't that big because you're holding them in your fingers. And uh, I guess that's how I would handle Neil deGrasse Tyson. And, uh, it, you know, if you're holding the universe in your hand. So there you go. So that was Space Force. That was Space Force. And it did influence my dream. And it was the PowerPoint presentation. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. FTMF. Hashtag FTMF. That's what I'm talking about. Tonight, Freddie Silva is here. We're going to do a deep dive into the far ancient past. We're going to talk about the possibility of ET contact with cultures around the world. Maybe, maybe not. What's Freddy think? We're going to be doing that tonight on the Game Changer and UnX Networks. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll be right back after this short break with Freddy Silva. Stay with me. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you know who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the fader knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Hi, folks. It's troubling times, and fear is pushing emotions, which in turn pushes health the wrong direction. Do you ever get an ache because life is uneasy? Try Life Change Tea at getthetea.com. Life Change Tea works on your digestive tract, helping to move food through quicker and comfortably so your health is spot on. Life Change Tea may not help with world issues, but it will help with your digestive issues. A glass a day helps keep the intruders away. So, change your life today. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. 
Dot com. If your health game is off, get on by ordering Life Change Tea. Get the tea dot com. And while you're on our site, look around at the great non-GMO organic supplements. And if you're a sales shopper, go to our specials page and see what's for you. I've been drinking the tea for 12 years and I'm sure glad for its health benefits. Again, that's get the tea dot com. Get the tea dot com. The tea that makes you go. The new KUNXDB, the UNX Network, bringing you the best in paranormal programming in premium, high-definition streaming audio and video. Log on to the network at unxnetwork.com and check out the growing lineup of programs, including Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and many more. Sign up for the free UNX newsletter, follow the UNX blog, or pick up the latest edition of the UNX magazine. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So check us out at unxnetwork.com. Tap the show page and the calendar so you never miss your favorite live shows and podcasts. We are your portal for all things paranormal. The X, explaining the unexplained. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Freddie Silva is back with us. Tomorrow night, John Greenwald is here. And Thursday night is another Fader night with open lines all night long. But tonight, it's all about Freddie. Trust me. Freddie is with us. And this is what, you know, this is what I discussed with Freddie. This is my introduction. I said, Freddie, we're just going to (laughs) talk. That's it. We're just going to talk, man. We're going to talk. We're going to do a deep dive in ancient history and the possibility of ET contact or what what has been going on in the far distant past. We're going to be doing that tonight. He is a best-selling author, leading researcher of ancient civilizations, restricted history, sacred sites, and their interaction with consciousness. He's also a leading expert on crop circles. He has published uh, seven books now. Is it seven? Just nod your head. It's seven books in six languages, described by one CEO as perhaps the best metaphysical speaker in the world right now. For two decades, he has been an international keynote speaker with notable appearances at the International Science and Consciousness Conference, the uh, International Society for the Study Study of Subtle Energies and Energy. That's not even real, Freddie. That That's made up. Uh, Gaia TV, History Channel, BBC, of course, Coast to Coast and Fade to Black. He's also a documentary filmmaker. He's a photographer and leads private tours to sacred sites in England, France, Egypt, Portugal, Yucatan, Malta, Peru, Bolivia, and Scotland. His most recent book is The Missing Lands, which examines the origin of gods before the Great Flood 11,000 years ago. He's got a new book on the way. I don't know if he's going to announce that tonight or not. Maybe I can get him to talk about it. His website is invisibletemple.com. I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black. Guitar player, guitar god, Freddie Silva. Freddie, good evening, my man. How are you? Hello, Jimmy. What's what's buy a guitar? What's that? You need to buy a guitar. I I do. I need I need I need another guitar. Yeah. I need another guitar. Um, here's the deal, Freddie. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm actually going to start because there's this conversation is uh is longer than the show will allow we have two and a half hours in front of us that's great but we're still going to run out of time there's a lot to say but the one question that needs to be asked at the very very front we're just going to jump straight into it we're going into the deep end of the pool how old are we and i think everybody wants to know that because we hear 
different figures. You know, uh, the Ice Age, 10,000 years ago, Stone Age man, Neanderthal, this and that, Homo sapiens sapien, it came in, Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon left, and and, and then there's 3,000 B.C. and, and ancient you know, uh, Sumerian texts that, that discuss this. And then we have, uh, Egypt and everything just started right there. And, and then we have the other side of the discussion, um, where things reach back much further than that. And certainly, uh, some of the text in, um, in the Sumerian language and, uh, ancient Egypt suggests something far older than that. But for you with your research, how, how old are we? Well, I think the weirdest thing that I've heard uh, is a uh, bit of research that came from a couple of physicists about 15 years ago. And they were looking at the strata of uh, where you find dinosaurs. And they found this unusual layer of soot, which they couldn't account for under climatic means. Now, I don't know how they came about uh, to figure that out. But they began to theorize, how do we know that there wasn't a dinosaur civilization? Because all the traits are there with this sort of layer of carbon that suggests the same sort of layer of soot that we created during the Industrial Revolution. And it got them thinking, you know, why not? I mean, uh, civilizations come and go. Uh, they talk about, the earliest cultures talk about things being, you know, big animals, big trees. Well, why not big people as well? Because we have the stories of giants and certainly giantesque people, not just tall people, but really giantesque people. And all things being equal, perhaps there was another layer of civilization that we still haven't have the courage to, or even the luck to find uh, during all of these digs. But to put it on a, a, a sort of a much more oral tradition, uh, I kind of admire people like the Aboriginal people of Australia, who they were um, talking to some, uh, I think, either physicists or meteorologists, one or the other, one of the ologists, and uh, they were pointing to this big sort of bowl in the middle of the outback of Australia. And they said, well, you know, there's a time when this fiery serpent came out of the sky and it made a big thunder and it hit the ground. And it was about, well, it was a long, long, long time ago. Uh, and the, the, the people said, well, you're talking about a meteorite. You, you actually remember a meteorite that landed in that valley. Now, we have no record of this. So... The geologists went to the site and they began to dig up the place. They used ground penetrating radar and lo and behold, they found the bit of rock that came out of the sky exactly as postulated in the oral traditions. And they finally worked out that this meteorite hit that piece of the earth one million years ago. So definitely the Aboriginal people were here one million years ago and they just rolled their eyes when you talked to them because they said, well, yes, you know, we, we can go back further than that, but you just won't believe us. So that's the benchmark, at least in terms of oral history. And then, of course, you've got the um, Sumerian texts, which are also borrowed from an earlier culture. And they talk about kingship being here on Earth for at least 140,000 years. And I thought, OK, now we're getting a little bit closer to our historical period. Right. There's one of my favorite texts, which is a, a, a an obscenely expensive book and a very rare one called The Mythical Origin of the Egyptian Temple, which I have now read for the seventh time, and I'm still deciphering stuff out of it. It's a dense book. You have to really go through the metaphors of what the Egyptians were writing. And they actually pin the start of the, uh, the gods around 39,000 BC. They give you specific dates for the actual groups of gods. So, for example, we tend to think of people like Ra and uh, Jehuti and Osiris as being ethereal mythical beings but to the egyptians they were very real people and they said that uh, yes these people were ethereal in one sense but there were people in the physical realm that also took on those names and their attributes and that group ran the uh, the cultures of egypt and also on islands somewhere in the middle of the indian ocean as far as i figured out for about thirteen thousand years and then another group comes along called the Followers of Horus, who governed for about 23,000. And then you show up at a time when you get the first ruler, and I quote, of a purely human bloodline taking the throne of Egypt in 3,100 BC. And we can validate that on the record. So you add these things up, and now you're already at 39,000 BC. So your guess is as good as mine. So we can go between 39,000 to 1 million years, according to the Aborigines, and then perhaps there's a, uh, a suggestion that there may have been a dinosaur culture as well. But that's still very much in the uh, embryonic stage. We just have 
to wait for a very lucky turn of the spade to come up with the right evidence. Yeah, and it, it, it's going to happen. Something's going to bust. And if we put all of this in context, um, and uh, I'm sitting in, my bunker here is about 25 feet wide, okay? Uh, maybe 15 feet deep, but it's 25 feet wide. So You really are protecting those guitars, aren't you? Yes, yes, there is uh, motion detectors <laughs> in, in this room. It, is this... Um, so if we span this room 25 feet wide to four and a half billion years, right? Let's just say that this room is four and a half billion years. Yep. And we look at uh, um, a culture that would come and go like right now, <laughs> we could, we could, we could go tomorrow, right? We could end our culture today uh, with the flick of a switch. Not that, not that difficult of a thought. So cultures come and go. And uh, Homo sapiens sapiens is 200,000 years, right? If, if we go with the orthodox view yeah. of, of academia. Okay, so let's just put that in, in just in context. Now, I've got four and a half billion years in front of me. This business card, the thickness is one million years. You know, and you, you just stop. And so you take a slice, right, of history <laughs> at yeah. any point in this four and a half billion years. Remember, in each billion is a thousand million, and you're you know you're stacking these up, and uh, and and you could you could take this anyway. You know, you could say this is a hundred thousand years. You know, just a slight uh, a million years. What is a million years in in this if we're stacking up? Four times one thousand million plus another half on top of that. Exactly, a, a little slice of history here and there is nothing, and anything could have come and gone. Exactly, and I mean, if you think about what we're doing right now, we're beginning to look at the finite nature of our planet that we're basically exhausting every single resource on the planet. In fact, by about July the sixteenth. Uh, we have actually, the earth has run out of uh, uh, things that it can replenish during that year. And that date is going back a few days every decade. So it's going to get to the point that by, by the time we get to March, the earth can no longer replenish its natural resources. And we're talking about you know, moving to Mars or finding another habitable planet somewhere else. Well, what if millions of years ago, the same was happening in another universe, that they too were facing the same ecocide, and they also had to find a way to live somewhere else? I mean, what, my first um, editor was um, working with two gentlemen called uh, Percy and Myers, David Percy and David Myers. They wrote a very, very profound book called uh, Two Thirds, A History of Our Galaxy. I do not recommend it to everybody because A, it's 800 pages thick and it's very, very thick with lots of decimal places and hyperdimensional math. It's not everybody's cup of tea. And part of it was channeled, but the mathematics is very correct. And they were the people that originally were looking at Cydonia before anyone knew what Cydonia on Mars was. And they were saying that there was a civilization there millions of years ago that had the same issues that we're having now. Kind of well, like uh, how the planet here that we're living on is starting to resemble Mars in many places. If, if, you, if you take a, a sort of a, a five-mile view from the Earth from the air, you begin to realize that uh, everything between, between the two tropics is starting to resemble Mars. Uh, it's like we come around full circle and we're now again talking about going somewhere else. And they were saying that that civilization on its death throes finally it was able to move to Earth. And one of the pieces of evidence that I found very compelling was that they took the geometry of all the pieces they have on Cydonia. So you have the, the five-pointed pyramid, you have the face and other structures. And there's a geometry and uh, using very uh, exotic numbers that links them all. Uh, and again, this is about hyperdimensional mathematics. And they were able to piece this on a smaller scale over the entire area of southern Britain, where today we find Avebury and Stonehenge, not that they're that old, by the way, but the sites upon which they stand appear to be much older, and they are a smaller version of a blueprint of the entire Cydonia region on Mars. Oh, wait, now, stop, 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 stop. You can't make that up. Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> I need to absorb what you just said. So for the audience, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that in this book, two-thirds of, of history, 
to the history of our galaxy. Okay, is uh, they mapped out with with uh, intentional deep math, Sidonia and the Sidonia region on Mars, and the correlation of the structures that are there mathematically, and then overlaid that on top of Avebury, which is Avebury is obviously much smaller. So they did what yes, they took. Exactly. So they took so they a, basically just did a small scale version and lined it up the entire South of Britain. And it matches the position of all the temples that we know there today. No, it doesn't. Are you serious? Uh, I, I am very serious. Now I, mean, I take this stuff and I go, well, whatever, but <laughs> I'm looking at the mathematics right, and I'm right. looking at the actual overlays and it is a perfect match. And I mean, perfect. I lived there. And uh, I was, uh, I did not take much convincing, and I usually take a lot of convincing. And this stuff is way out there. And in fact, the thing that really began to get very weird is that when I began to research the crop circles when I lived there, the same exotic angles were actually connecting this, the stone circles to the crop circles, the crop circles to each other, and the crop circles to the local sacred sites. And these are weird things like, uh, you know, 19.47 degrees, which is the tetrahedral angle, the, uh, you know, the tetrahedron that you can imagine inside the Earth. So think of the Earth as a kind of a, a spinning a ball of matter. And I'm, I'm talking about the Earth itself. I'm talking about the atoms that make up the uh, physical structure of the Earth spinning at great speed, giving the illusion that we are very physical when we're actually not. And it's actually made up by two... Uh, upside down tetrahedrons and that the geometry where those tetrahedrons touch the surface of the sphere of this planet is 19.47 degrees and that's where you get the most active hot spot on the face of the earth which is Mauna Loa volcano while well, the same geometry the same angle appears on Mars with the biggest shield volcano on Mars the uh, the biggest shield volcano on Venus the sunspots locations on the face of the sun and the red spot on Jupiter they're all the same angle of 19.47 and these are to do with hyperdimensional mathematics to do with propulsion after that I'll leave it to David Myers and David Percy sure to sure explain because now we're talking decimal places and it's way above my pay grade but it's worth looking at. Uh, if you have uh, about um, eight months uh, uh, to do nothing and read this book uh, and borrow it from the library, by all means, um, definitely get into this stuff because it certainly will expand your understanding of what may have happened. Now, is it true? I don't know. But again, mathematically and geometrically, it all adds up very, very nicely. That's what I like about the theory. Now, if um, if this is... If this is true in that there is a direct correlation between uh, areas on different planetary bodies, you know, you just mentioned the sun too as well. It's just not the earth and, and, uh, and Mars. But if this is true, then what we are suggesting here is that there has been uh, interplanetary space travel in, at the least just inside of our solar system, right? That's what that would have to suggest. And it might start explaining why people who were supposedly, according to the Orthodox tradition, hunter-gatherers 12,000 years ago, were writing in the Indian texts about Vimana craft and incredible structures that could come out of the sky and move across the face of the earth in the blink of an eye and building incredible temples which are now underwater. Uh, and you can date uh, these academies, which are now under the sea by the terms that they give you in the Indian traditions. Now, if you're a hunter-gatherer and you're basically uh, trying to kill a few mammoths for dinner, make some barbecue and drag your wife by the hair into the cave, mm -hmm. you don't have that kind of imagination. You haven't even discovered writing yet. So where did they get these elaborate stories from? The two ideas are incompatible. You either have savages or you have people who have a direct eyewitness account and they were able to write this and they leave it to us to work it out. And I begin to suspect that these um, traditions that we're left with, these smidgens of ideas, are little bits of eyewitness accounts that survived from a time long ago when there was a remnant of someone else here, a parallel civilization, which any culture that I've interacted with from South America all the way to Egypt has said, yes, we lived alongside a much more advanced culture. And uh, they, uh, I love this phrase, they call them human-like but not quite human. 
uh, the very tall, not giant, but very tall. So compared to me, and I'm six foot five, they would have been about eight and a half feet tall. And the height is actually mentioned at the Temple of Karnak in Egypt. It's actually written right on the wall. So they we're talking about the remnants of an old civilization that by the time we began to write about it and inherit their traditions, they already been long gone. They're already on the downslope of, uh, of civilization. And this is the moment where they began to teach us the accoutrements of civilization, because that's where we get the stories, you know, after the Great Flood in 9703 BC, uh, that uh, we suddenly interacted directly with these people and they gave us the uh, tools in which to grow crops and uh, do animal husbandry and work out mathematics and look at stargazing, all at the same time in about 8,500 BC. So if you just step back for a little bit, that starts to track very nicely. Because this parallel civilization knew that they were much more advanced than hunter-gatherers and they didn't want to directly intervene in their own natural development. But because of necessity, when everybody pretty much died during the flood, except for 10% of the entire population of the earth, they had to mingle with humans and say, look, none of us are going to survive unless we start helping each other. We're going to have to teach you things which are way above your pay grade. And now we're going to leave it up to you to raise yourselves from where, where you are, you know, behaving like animals and living in caves without any clothes. And eventually you come to be like us. And I like that theory because it begins to have a logic to it. There's a nice sense of continuity there that as one culture is going downhill, we're now evolving, borrowing from their traditions. There is, um, uh, you know, today we we uh, talk about Gobekli Tepe a lot, as we should. And there's Karahunj, of course, in 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 um, Armenia, and we'll talk about that on an, uh, on another show. We can talk more about it now, but um, and and we know about these things. But there, it, I want to start. Uh, I want to ask you about a little midpoint because you just brought something up. You said eight eight and a half thousand. Uh, years ago and and or 8000 BC there is a site in Egypt that gets ignored and well first off it's because it's been moved and that's the other thing that but I'm talking about Napta Playa and 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 Napta Playa is a calendar not much different in function and form than Stonehenge except uh, it's been dated at uh, uh, between seven and eight thousand BC. Yeah, and that, it's like, what? Well, wait a minute here. You know, Gobekli Tepe. Okay, going back to ten thousand five hundred BC, and we've radiocarbon dated, and we're pretty comfortable in that number. And it's a big site, and and we think that there was nothing in between Gobekli Tepe and and Giza, and that's simply not true. Napta Playa. Um, it, which is a, a stone circle calendar in the middle of the desert uh, west of Cairo and south of Cairo um, that was built, uh, you know, 8,000 B.C. And, exactly. And how, I mean, we just haven't found this stuff, and a lot of it has also been pillaged. I mean, even during our historical period, a lot of the temples that were using big stones They've all been pillaged to build farmhouses or uh, pharaohs' houses and so forth. So a lot of the information that we need to gather the, you know, the, the story is missing. I mean, for example, uh, I've actually dated the Osirian at about 50 years younger than the, uh, the Great Pyramid. Uh, it's about 10,500 BC, just by the alignment of what it was looking at when it once stood on the actual Nile Plain. Uh, and it's right there to see it. In fact, the, um, the Seti who built his temple... Let's see, uh, it would have been 1300 BC, so uh, 9,000 years later on top of the Assyrian, but he stops short and then the temple turns left as though right. he tried to build above it and he cracked the ceiling uh, of the Assyrian and went, ah, that's not a good idea. Uh, he left a clue on the very last room of the temple and only those who were really persistent, you know, people like me who are extremely persistent and go there again and again, the clues are usually in the last uh, portion of the temple where most people are already tired and they don't want to look at any more hieroglyphs and they move on. And of course, I'm right in the corner and the information is actually right there. The clue that gives you the, the, um, the date of the Assyrian relative to the temple that's above it. So we have these bits slowly coming out of the woodwork uh, all over the place. And uh, of course, we also have, uh, well, I, let, let's bring it up. We, uh, we have uh, um, Kudaheng in uh, Armenia, uh, which is just north of uh, 
I'm not going to call it Gobek de Tepe. I'm going to call it by its original name in Armenian, which is Portasar, which means the umbilical cord of Osiris. Now, there's a uh, a very telling story. Uh, that's now been uh, recalibrated to about 25,000 BC, and then it was recalibrated uh, at 5,000 BC because the stone circle by then had already fallen out of alignment with the stars. And there's a lot of Armenian uh, physicists uh, in that region who are taking a huge deep, in deep interest in this site. It turns out to be the oldest stone circle in the world. So between these little bits that we have, we begin to see that there's a history that's missing in between those key monuments. So again, it's going to take another lucky turn of the spade or maybe some uh, lidar like we found in Central America. Mm -hmm. We're discovering all kinds of hidden civilizations down there. And of course, all you have to do is ask the locals. They know we can't keep following academia. Uh, we can't trash academia either because they, they're useful to a certain degree. But the academia is very limited in what it allows itself to do because it doesn't want to be ridiculed. Now, if you uh, tell, uh, if you go to, for example, Guatemala, which is one of my favorite places, um, I spoke to some of the archaeologists down there who are very open-minded. And as I was talking about what I know from the academic world about the uh, pyramids of uh, Guatemala, and they just laughed at me and I said, you know, off the record, all of these hills here, these are all pyramids. We know they're pyramids because our great-grandfathers were there to collect things. We do sit on these big stones, but we don't have the money to dig them up. So, Okay, we've. Uh, uh, I'm just going to let you know, Freddie. We just started to break up there at the end, so I'm going to just go ahead and take our commercial right now. And uh, this is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Freddie Silva. I'll reset everything during the break. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We're doing the deep dive in ancient history. The deep dive. Was there contact of any kind? All that and much more with Freddie after this short break. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, BX. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one year anniversary. That's right. One year, and as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. <laughs> Damn it. Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. 
When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Hello, I'm Kathleen and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on jimmychurchradio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. <laughs> Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church, tonight, Freddie Silva. All right. We've kind of set the stage uh, for the conversation tonight. Doing a deep dive. We're going into uh, ancient history and, and what was going on back then and the possibility of VT contact or, or, or what these ancient cultures were referring to. And uh, to uh, Freddie, if we made a kind of uh, steer this in a certain direction... Um, I, I, I think that most of us feel uh, today, as we get a little smarter as each day passes, that we know that these ancient cultures had their gods and demigods and, and referred to them uh, uh, often, right? It's part of their culture. And that were they inserting or using, you know, but they didn't have any other way to look at it that the possibility of the gods that they were referring to coming from the heavens well, or from the stars and that these could have been extraterrestrial civilizations reaching out. Um, but I, when, when I say something like that, what's your take? Um, from my experience, uh, there are two sides to the story and they're totally compatible. Uh, first of all, let's define what a god was to these people. Right. Uh, a god essentially is a spirit form that's bound in nature. So, for example, a table has a god, a blade of grass has a god, water has a god. And any individual who masters the understanding of that element becomes as a god. So even you and I, uh, if we master the art of, say, fine scotch whiskey, we become the god of whiskey, mm -hmm. uh, just to sort of bring it down to its natural vernacular. Now, if you ask people in the Native American Southwest, like the Hopi or the Zuni or the uh, Lakota further north, they are adamant that uh, there's been physical contact for as long as anyone can remember. And in fact, if you look at the, uh, the history of the Hopi who were rescued from their sinking island in the middle of the Pacific just before a global flood, uh, they were assisted by people who would be gods by any other means. And uh, their names, especially one of them, one of their central figures is Masao, turns out to be the very name, the original name of Mount Ararat, which is the holy mountain of Armenia. So you have a connection now here from Armenia all the way 
to the Hopi territories of, of the Southwest America. And um, they've said that after a while, the contact took on the form of working with these people who came from another place in time uh, on their flying shields, and they're still doing it today. In fact, uh, we were discussing this a few days ago in Florida, you and I, how uh, the late Clifford Mahuti was telling me that uh, on occasion he'd go and sit on the uh, the canyon lands and um, he invited me over to come and have a, a chat. Unfortunately, uh, he passed away before I could uh, take him up on his offer. And he said, you know, very regularly, the, uh, these people come from another place. Uh, usually Orion comes, uh, in, uh, the name Orion pops up in the conversation. And they're saying that today they come and go uh, easy as you and I go shopping for a can of baked beans. And uh, they use these flying vessels as their mode of operation. Now, on another level of reality, we talk about people in Easter Island. There's a group of people you've probably never heard of called the Waitaha. And uh, they are indigenous to Easter Island at a time when they called it an archipelago, and that's only happened 11,000 years ago. Talk about a tribal memory, and the oral tradition has only been published very recently, and uh, I published, uh, republished a lot of it in, my, in The Missing Lands to give, you know, give them a voice using my platform, because they deserve it. And they talked about a time when the gods were here on Earth, and they were called the Urukeu, they were called the red-headed people. And uh, they were going from this big land in the uh, in the east, so it had been South America. There was another big island in between Easter Island and South America called Kainga Nui Nui. Uh, there'll be a test on this, by the way. <laughs> uh, and that sank during the global flood. And they used to go to Easter Island to take on food, water. And they used to talk to the shaman of the tribe. And they used to engage in wisdom and teaching and sharing the knowledge that they knew. And uh, they'd say goodbye. Uh, they sent them on their way. And the Urukei would then get onto their double hull catamarans and they used to sail to New Zealand to a place called, wait for it, the birthplace of the gods. And I can tell you, having been there five times, it is one of the most sublime places on earth. Um, totally put it at the top of your bucket list. It's worth going to. And then they used to go back uh, to, uh, they, used to they used to miss um, Easter Island because of the way the currents work. And they used to go to a place in the east, in the high Andes, uh, called, uh, and I thought, well, wh where could this be? And I looked in their traditions and they gave me a clue. They said that whenever they uh, uh, took on uh, the food and the water and boarded their catamarans to take this big sailing project over to South America, they would take two totem birds with them. One was called Titi and the other one was called Kaka. And together they, call, they are called Titicaca. So now we know that in Lake Titicaca, there used to be an island called Tiwanaku, which means the school of distant learning. And of course, uh, it's also associated with the Aku Shemsuhor, which are the gods of Egypt. So these people who were master seafarers now, not just on flying ships, but they were here living on islands, at least seven as far as I've been able to figure out, all around the world, and they were master seafarers, and of course, by default, they were also master astronomers, and that's what enabled them to align their temples to the stars and become mirrors of the cosmos. So there's two things going on here. We have a connection to the stars, usually associated with Orion, and then we have the uh, terrestrial gods who are great seafarers, but they too, regardless of the culture that I've investigated, were also intimately associated with Orion, specifically the belt stars, and, it, uh, and even more specifically, the triangle in between the belt stars and the bottom star, which forms a central region called M42, the, uh, the, uh, what NASA describes as the, the biggest star-forming region of the galaxy. And they yep. called it the heart of the sky. Now, in order to understand that that is a star-forming region, you would have had to have actual experience of this or knowledge of it, which meant that you had to have contact with people who came from there. Now, uh, what kind of timeline are we on? Uh, I should say modern timeline, okay? Our version of timeline <laughs> uh, with this uh, seafaring uh, action that was going on. 
They were uh, very adamant. And if you overlay the Hopi tradition on top of the White Heart tradition, they are describing the three periods uh, of destruction, which were the three ice ages. So we're talking 15,000, 13,000, and then 12,000 BC, the three driest periods, essentially. Sure. Uh, and by then, these cultures were already on the wane. They took it really hard. I mean, they took it on the chin, because like I said, they appear to be living on islands, which most of them no longer exist. Uh, the only uh, exception is what's left of Lake Titicaca at Tiwanaku. Mm -hmm. And now Lake Titicaca is now 15 miles away from Tiwanaku. And the other one is a, a kind of island uh, which is at the oxbow of the Metsamore River in the Armenian Highlands, which is where the Anunnaki used to live. And that's something I'm investigating right now. Uh, so we're talking at least, as, as far as their tradition goes, they're covering at least the three driest periods of the Ice Age. Now, if, if, if we just follow uh, modern anthropology and archaeology and historians, if, if we stay there, there is no way that those cultures should know anything about the development of stars in a star cluster, you know, known today as M42. Uh, no, unless somebody came from there and shared that wisdom. Exactly. I mean, when you when you that specific, uh, like the, let's like the Dogon, for example. I mean, unless they had exceptionally good eyesight and had except, exceptional shamanic means, which they did, by the way, uh, you would have the only other way to know that these are star forming regions and they are specific junction places in the universe would have been to have contact with people who were intimate with those locations and they gave that information to the local culture and it stayed in the folklore because you know when all things fall apart, folklore is a wonderful mechanism. Because because it tells you so much about eyewitness interactions between people that were moving about the planet. And uh, the, the other thing that surprised me during my research is that people 10, 12,000 years ago were getting about the planet much easier than we've given them credit for. And uh, if you go to Tonga today, and uh, I was about to go there before the, um, uh, the tsunami, which is a bit sad, they still make the catamarans in the same shape and design that were given to them by the gods before the flood. And they are incredible uh, machines. These things are seaworthy, and they'll take up to 200 people, and uh, quite comfortable too. Now, the uh, the subject of Orion, uh, which I that's what I was I was showing the audience uh, my brief little notes. But I had wrote Orion uh, down uh, early on because I wanted to come back and touch upon this because I feel that it's so important. But here's here's the thing. I don't – I'm just now understanding the stars. Um, uh, I'm not saying last week, you know, the last 10 years and, and, and looking. But now when I go outside, I, I pretty much have a grip of what's going on. I can glance up and and, and have a pretty solid foundation. But I cannot take my eyes off of Orion. I can't I do it. I, I just look immediately there, and then I'll glance around at everything else first, right? And I seem to have a personal. I'm not getting all woo woo on everybody. Oh, go but, on. But but I can't take my <laughs> eyes off of it. And it's it, incredible. It, yeah, it, it would seem that everybody else and <laughs> since the dawn of man. That. I mean, for example, you know that lovely uh, the Tai Arch, sorry, the uh, Tori Arch, which defines the Japanese Shinto culture in those beautiful red arches with the cross section at the top. Yep, that cross section is actually the it represents the belt stars of Orion. And the center, which is where we, you and I walk through to get to the temple, is called the breath of God. And you see this repeated in Central America, where you see rooms in the temple in the shape of a T. That's the Tao. That is the breath of God. You literally are walking into the breath of creation itself, which goes back to the, what I was saying before about these indigenous people regarding that triangular area just below the belt of Orion as being M42, the star forming region of the universe. Uh, and again, and also the, the big Kiva at uh, Shaku Canyon uh, to bring back Clifford Mahuti yet again. Uh, I always said to him, you know, it's always bothered me that people talk about the uh, the big Kiva as a Kiva. It seems very impractical and also very impersonal. And Kivas are very personal things. They're supposed to be shamanic moments. They're supposed to represent a sort of a womb. But this thing looks like an arena. And he said, no, you're quite right, because it was never meant as a Kiva. That's what some archaeologists worked out. But they never asked us 
And I said, well, what's your take? Well, my people's take is uh, that uh, we've always known it was a place where the flying shields used to land. It's a spaceport. And then look at the back of where you go into the actual uh, center of the temple. I said, yeah, this, it's a big doorway shaped like a T. And I went, oh, my God, you're telling me that when you got off the, uh, the ship, you'd go through the doorway as the breath of God into the actual heart of the temple. I said, yep. Uh, it was a wonderful moment where we're just sharing this information and uh, putting one and one together. And it's right there in front of you. They're telling you the story. That canyon. Uh, uh, let's let's stop here for a second. When I see that and, uh, you know, the main section, let's just start right there. It is it's ginormous. But you think about uh, the population of the culture back then. How did they pull that off? I, I don't know. We can talk about the Giza and Stonehenge and, and, and Peru and, 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 and so forth, you know, with these giant megalithic structures. We've got that going on right here in the United States and North America. And, yeah. But it's not just that. If you look at all of the other kivas and the other sacred sites that are there, they are all astronomically aligned. Yeah. And also there was a big population here uh, in that time of the world. It was also much wetter. Uh, for example, if you go into some of the canyons in Utah and the uh, Horseshoe Canyon is a classic one, you go to a place called the Ghost Panel and there are other petroglyph panels in that three and a half hour walk along the dry riverbed. But they're all very uniformly about 12 feet above the uh, the ground that I kept. I, I was sitting there for hours just looking at this, meditating. And I thought, you know, it's funny. It's as if all of them were actually painted while someone was on a boat. And when this was much wetter, and of course it was, up until about 4000 BC, that was a big oasis, just like Egypt was. It had trees, it had plants, it had an aquaculture. And then, of course, as the uh, earth changes uh, came upon us and we were hit by more meteorites, uh, something that Robert Schock has uh, researched very well, and I think he's got a very good point. And also we were hit with several solar flares that changed the entire climate of the earth. And of course it becomes drier and then people start to basically gather together and start building places like Shaku Canyon. Mm -hmm. And uh, they start to, you know, get the resources, the, the little resources that they have available, they start uh, bringing them together and using what little they have. So the place starts growing. So we're now talking over 2000 years of growth. You have the central temple area, but then you have the add-ons, which this is why it looks so huge because it keeps getting added on and added on like a bit like a Lego structure over time. The, uh, I remember driving through New Mexico and uh, it's about as dramatic and as beautiful as, as any place on earth, right? And you're driving through and you're looking at, uh, these, uh, you know, the canyons and the walls off in the distance. And you know what? The only thing th that goes through my mind, Freddie, is that those are islands. Those are all islands. Yeah. You could see that, that, that was 200 feet of water, 300 feet of water, uh, you know, above you. And those are, you can see it. And yeah. it's, it's just a crazy thought. Okay. Let me back. I'm going to get back to the belt of Orion. You brought up Japan. And I find that very interesting. We know about the possible correlation of, of Giza and Orion's belt, too, as well. Um, how many cultures around the world have these same specific ties to Orion? Um, quite a lot of them. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was looking, uh, researching the material for the missing lands, I devoted the entire chapter just to this connection. Uh, I have even just found another one in Scotland. Uh, not to try and give too much away for the next show, but there are three uh, very prominent structures on uh, a, a, an island, uh, an archipelago to the north of Scotland, which are the exact mirror image uh, of the uh, Great Pyra uh, the Pyramids of Giza with the one offset, which mim mimics the belt of Orion. Right. And in fact, it does, the, the main stone circle also points to a certain bowl in the landscape where you see the first rising of Orion's belt over northern Scotland for the first time, um, about 5,500 BC. Uh, so they were up there as well. And in fact, if you take the Giza Plateau plan, you invert it and you put it on top of the three stone circles, it's absolute dead match. The pinnacles of the pyramids match exactly the positioning of the stone circles. That's just one in the very at the highest latitude that I found. And they're also everywhere. I mean, we have Gobekli Tepe, for example. Sorry, Portasar. <laughs> um, 
If you're not looking at the north, uh, I, I'm not totally convinced that the north alignment is what the thing is trying to mimic. I think it's the south part because the south uh, and the southeast of, um, sort of area of the temple is the natural viewpoint to the horizon. And between three of the stones, they mark the exact rising, the midheaven and the setting of the rising of the belt of Orion in 10,500 BC on the winter solstice. Uh, whereas at Giza, the same date is commemorated at the equinox. So there's a connection between those as well. And in fact, one of those moments which, uh, this is what I love about my work, if I just put my pen down for a second and just let the spirit of place talk to me, and now we're getting very woo-woo, uh, and I'm very proud of this because I'm shown this image. Uh, you know, I've just worked out that Porta Sar means the umbilical cord of Orion. So it's a mixture of uh, ancient Egyptian with ancient Armenian language here. And I, I suddenly had this vision of drawing a cord between the three pyramids uh, and connecting to Portasar. Well, it turns out if you draw a, a point at the corner of Menkaure's pyramid and you go through to the corner of the Great Pyramid, because they are misaligned, remember, you end up exactly at Portasar. There's your umbilical cord of Osiris, and there's a, been a lot of uh, intermarrying between the dynastic uh, uh, people of Armenia and also of Egypt, to the point where Nefertiti herself has been suspected of being of uh, Armenian origin, and the Armenian people are very much adamant that yes, she was. Uh, her name actually means something in Armenian. And now I have forgotten what it was. I was about to come up with this, but we'll talk about it on the next show. <laughs> yeah, but, no problem. Uh, there is a letter where she addresses her father. and She's saying, um, you know, uh, the ruler of the kingdom of the north, that's her father, to send a dowry down to Egypt because she's marrying Akhenaten. Well, the kingdom to the north of Egypt at that time was the uh, Armenian uh, kingdom. So there is this big tradition between uh, Egypt and Armenia that we need to look at here so the connection with orion goes to the middle east and then of course the anunnaki were always associated with orion as well and i've excuse me and i find this throughout the pacific in the solomon islands i find it in uh, um, indochina in china as well it's, it's it's everywhere and the more i keep prodding the more it comes out and even in central america they also talk about the uh, people of the serpent which is their title of office uh, if you understand the laws of nature, which behave like a serpent, the electromagnetic lines of energy, you are a person of the serpent. It has nothing to do with reptilians. And I'm sorry to disappoint a lot of people. It was a title of office. And they are also in Central America and specifically Yucatan associated with Orion to the point where the old houses of the local people, when you constructed the house, the hearth at the center of the house, you had three stones, one stone each for the three belt stars. Wouldn't it be interesting uh, if the search for <coughs> Nefertiti's tomb, her burial chamber, which, you know, they're looking in Egypt, wouldn't it be interesting if they found it up in the Armenian highlands? Now, that would be very interesting. Um, by the way, I just remembered what uh, Nefertiti means in Armenian. The name means she who is the backbone of the pharaoh. Is that right? Absolutely. Now, I had uh, 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 Vahan Setian, uh, yes. who you had on your show many times ago. Uh, yes. He was. He didn't. He didn't realize it at the time, but he was uh, instrumental in helping me understand the Armenian language. I had to actually learn Armenian to write the new book. He teaches uh, Armenians about the Armenian language. Make no mistake about it. He is incredible. He's, He's a true linguist. percent of German language is based on Armenian. English language is based on Armenian. Uh, Gaelic, uh, Celt. Well, there's no such thing as Celt. A Celt is basically anyone who wasn't a Roman. It was just basically a foreigner. It applied to anybody. Uh, but the Gaelic uh, traditions, uh, certainly the west coast of France, uh, Brittany, where we have a great connection of uh, sacred sites in Europe. Uh, it used to be called Admorica. And it still is by the local people. Well, that's an Armenian phrase. It means the uh, when the um, uh, when the sun descends into mother, referring to the ocean. That's what Armorica means. So it's amazing how much language has come out of that uh, those Armenian highlands, uh, which is where our friends the Anunnaki used to hang out uh, originally. Now uh, uh, back to Orion's Belt, and then we'll we'll pick this up after the break. We've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, when Robert Bavall, uh first released his book, which was at the time controversial, but uh, I think today we are definitely more and more comfortable 
with uh, structures on, you know, terrestrial uh, structures um, lining up with Orion's belt. And uh, with the more that I look at it and watch, I go outside and, and watch Orion uh, when it's first popped up, right? And I see it. And, but I watch it shift in the sky, right, as, as, as the night moves on and see it move slightly and see how it, the alignment is a bit different. Well, you, you can back this alignment up with software and, yeah. and actually pinpoint these dates and you can, Absolutely. yeah. And that's, that's and the I fascinating it, part. Uh, yeah. I found it all over Sardinia. Uh, in my last research, the temples there are all connected to a priestly cast of unusual people who were astronomers, uh, very tall again, red hair. And, uh, they were intimately associated with the Rhine and there's a major alignment in the middle of Sardinia, which also mirrors that, but it's not just the alignments. It's the fact that it's gray ingrained in the cultures, in the oldest cultures on earth. And, uh, I mean, I did a whole documentary on this, uh, called Orion, uh, the origin of the gods. And, uh, it was astonishing just how many ancient cultures associate these people as either having come from Orion physically being associated symbolically or metaphorically with Orion with Orion being a kind of a junction box. And they said that at one point when they forgot how to get from here to there, they built certain monuments around the face of the earth with a certain geometry and a certain technology uh, in order to allow themselves to be transported physically from A to B. And that's also very true of the Great Pyramid. Uh, I mean, I'm still in awe of uh, the way these uh, free pyramids work. And you go in there, uh, into the Great Pyramid especially, and unless you're very well prepared, uh, people uh, have known to, be, to, to die in there. Uh, because leaving uh, the body when you're in the Great Pyramid is very, very easy. Anybody could do it. The problem is coming back, and that's why they had to learn 530 spells to remind you of your journey back into the physical world. So we're now beginning to realize that these stories that are written on pet in petroglyphs or in hieroglyphs all over the place are telling us the very mechanism that they used to get from A to B. And then when you correlate these to the Pacific stories mm -hmm. uh, in Polynesia, they said, yes, uh, they forgot how to do it. It's almost as though we're becoming much more physical in this reality. And they forgot that uh, connection to be able to go backwards and forwards through time tunnels. So they built structures in order to allow them to get there. And then they forgot how to do that, too. So now they just did it shamanically. And that's what we try to do during Spirit Quest. So I found it very convincing because so many cultures overlay the stories over each other. So it means that there must have been a kind of manual that they were all borrowing from. Are you speaking? I've, I've got uh, 20 seconds. Are you speaking from experience about the King's Chamber and leaving one's body? Oh, yes. That's why I quit my day job. Leaving uh, inside that box is very easy. Returning is a bit more di difficult. And I let's just say I have a lot of help uh, in the work that I do, and I'm very grateful. I, I call it the management. But yes, there have been times when I take a group of people in there. In fact, I'm about to go there in two weeks. And uh, there, I don't tell people what I see coming out of the stones, and there's at least half of the group afterwards will tell me what they saw and i can say that's exactly what i saw they're seeing what i'm experiencing while we're meditating in the great pyramid to the point where we look up and there's no ceiling we can actually see the milky way inside the great uh, pyramid uh, you cannot pay enough money uh, if you can't put a monetary value on these experiences and that's why i love doing what i do uh, if you if you go there experiencing uh, expecting something it won't happen it usually happens when we're of one mind and we're not expecting anything to happen and then magic begins to happen at these places so they're very much alive uh, these connecting points let's you just have to connect with them let's take our break right here things coming out of the walls i love that <laughs> <laughs> it's coming back. That's the issue. This is Fade to Black. I'm your Simi Church tonight, Freddie Silva. More when we come back after this short break. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. <laughs> You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. It's a 
mis amigos, yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! This is Jimmy Church. Jason Martell's book, Knowledge Apocalypse, 10-Year Anniversary Edition, is now available. Most ancient cultures speak of a time when their gods visited them. They never say their gods came from across the ocean or from the mountains. They always came down from the skies. Was ancient man visited by gods or extraterrestrials? We have not been told the full truth about our human past. There was a time when all the ancient cultures lived amongst beings they considered their gods. The search for truth leads us down the path of learning where the ETs might come from and why they are here. To understand some of these advanced topics and learn the truth about human origins, buy the new book from Jason Martell, Knowledge Apocalypse. Now in its 10-year anniversary edition available on Amazon.com by clicking on the banners over on our site or simply visit JasonMartell.com. That's JasonMartell.com. Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, an extraordinary conversation going down with with Freddie Silva. And I, I had the, uh, the honor and the privilege uh, to hang out with uh, Freddie this weekend. And uh, the conversations uh, that, that we had, and I was just like, Freddie, we, 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 we've got to shut up. We've got to save this for the show. <laughs> We're still recovering. Yeah, it was, uh, it was an amazing weekend. Lots of knowledge shared. <laughs> Amongst friends, but um, uh, I want to, you brought this up earlier, and we've got to circle back, and that is umbilical cord. That That isn't some free-form statement. There is some deep meaning to this, and uh, I, I, I want to get into this uh, pretty deeply. So 
Um, oh, and it, before we do, though, everybody, you need to know that Jimmy keeps teasing me with his guitars. I just want to tease him. <laughs> I can do it, too. I can tease, too, baby. Oh, you know what? You know what? Okay. Um, uh, no. Uh, hold on. Hold on. Bring it Bring it back. That's you've, umbilic- umbilical cord. <laughs> you've got uh, – that's the umbilical cord right there. You've got, uh, uh, you've got a dual rails – uh, humbucker single coil in 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 the bridge very and, hot rail uh, i love that pickup and uh it's uh, very nice yeah i've got i've got a few guitars with those in it and i love uh, the sound of that pickup ow so anyway that, back to our little chords Fred, <laughs> freddie's showing off his black strat and uh it's I'm gorgeous. just getting you back <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's awesome that's awesome okay umbilical cord Yes. Um, it, this isn't like, you know, like, uh, you know, la di da, this isn't just some thing. There's a deep meaning to it. And, uh, we can maybe start with Armenia for sure, but they're not the only culture. Yeah. And it was really to do with, I, I how did I get onto this? It was, it was one of those moments where you had this leap of imagination. And I think I was re looking at the, orientation of Gobekli Tepe, trying to make some sense of it. I wasn't very convinced with the Cygnus theory. Um, all, uh, credit, uh, you know, all credit due to my good friend. Uh, but I, I was not comfortable with it uh, for a lot of reasons. One, mostly because Cygnus tends to go under uh, the horizon and is blocked by an entire hill. The natural view of that um, temple is really to Orion. And then when I began to look at the etymology of Portasar and the umbilical cord, it's as though as if like there's an image that suddenly pops up in my head. And I realized, well, wait a minute. The uh, people who were uh, living in that part of the world, the Anunnaki, they, the term that was given to them was the shining people, the shining ones, because they were they had a problem with being very light-skinned. They uh, had to keep putting a kind of oil on their skin to protect itself from the sun like a sunscreen and the, the book of Enoch is very adamant about that description and I suddenly realized well, wait a minute these are the Aku uh, people which is the Aku Shemsu Hor of Egypt so there must be a connection between the people of Orion who built the pyramids and the structures of Egypt who are also the shining ones and the shining ones around the Armenian highlands of which Gobekli Tepe of course was part of in the very very old days before Turkey was even a figment of the imagination in the eye of the beholder. So it was just a matter of linking the two together and realizing that these stories, the names that they give to these places, are telling you what their function is all about. So it's very important to understand the original names that the places are given because it tells you the folklore with which they're associated. Um, so same thing when I was researching material in Sardinia and also in Scotland, you have to understand what the name means because it's trying to tell you a snapshot in time of something that occurred there a long time ago. So you'd never forget it. So they didn't leave uh, you know, detailed records of what was going on. You have to decipher the information. And all of it comes down again back to astronomy. Uh, it's about the alignments. They always kept memorializing dates and events linking certain po- points in time based on the alignment of the temple. Uh, it drives archaeologists crazy, but unfortunately, it happens all around the world. You can date a site, but what it's looking at, the trick is you've got to look at the folklore and the mythology of the local land in order to understand what it's looking at. Uh, you can usually start with the moon or the winter solstice, sunrise, or the spring equinox. Those are very prevalent throughout the world. To find what it's looking at in terms of a constellation or a specific star, now you've got to get deep into the indigenous history. Uh, and that's where you've got to go and hang out with these people or what, uh, what's left of them and ask them questions and get them to trust you that I'm not going to take your information and steal it and change it. I want to be a spokesperson. Uh, I want to speak your words through me to a bigger audience so we can understand that we as a human race share the same history. And the more I travel around the world, even in remote Pacific Islands, I find that I'm hearing the same information that someone in Scotland is telling me or someone in Sardinia is telling me. And I'm thinking, how is it possible that these people know about these stories? Uh, And of course, the net effect is that the information that we have missing in Egypt or in India or in the Middle East gets filled in in other parts of the world because the stories are always overlapping. And that's what's beautiful about this. 
uh, it kind of brings the whole of the human race together when you think about it. That, you know, there might be a piece of information in South America which fills in the gap in Egypt and the bit in Armenia that fills in the gap, say, in Australia. And I'm finding this now at the point where we're looking at uh, almost like it feels like the end of the world sometimes, doesn't it? Uh, that we are beginning to realize that we're all one culture and we all come from one specific place. Now, uh, the umbilical cord, um, uh, I'll say metaphor, the, uh, that metaphor is, to me, in my mind's eye, is not a terrestrial metaphor, a literal, you know, to, it, it, it's, it's reaching out to the stars. It's the umbilical cord to Orion. Is it yeah. suggesting that that's our connection? We come from Orion? The ancients always spoke in multiple layers of symbology. Uh, right. So when you reach the first layer, which is the physical connection, the geodetic connection between Giza and Gobekli Tepe, that's your first umbilical cord. The second layer is look at the sites of where they're located, limestone and limestone aquifers. When you have water percolating through limestone, you create an electrical charge in the land. This is why so many of the uh, the, the sort of groups of temples around the world, uh, let's say France and Southern Britain being the best examples, they are always based on top of limestone or chalk, which is the chemical equivalent of limestone. So you've already got a land which is based or has an electrical charge. Then you've got the stones, which have a high degree of magnetite, iron, and a specific type of quartz, which is highly piezoelectric. That's why they went through a lot of trouble to get these stones. They didn't just pick up that stone. They went 400 miles to get a specific stone. And then they arrange it in a certain geometric alignment. And when you put these things down, what they do is they begin to attract the telluric currents of the earth, the serpent lines. And they ground the energy to the stones. And, they be, and then they begin to act like these transformers. So any shaman around the world will say, yes, that's one of the primary reasons why they built these places, because... Inside the stone circles, inside the pyramids, inside the temples of the world, we can now measure the energy field being ever so slightly different than outside, but it's that small difference that allows you to have an exchange of information with another level of reality. Mm. Now, and in the old days, they said you could actually do this physically back then. Nowadays, we don't know how to do it, so we do it shamanically. You can leave the body and go astral traveling, but you are there in physical form, even though your physical body is back here on Earth. It's almost like uh, um, when I was writing the uh, the book, The Last Art of Resurrection, that's what it was all about. It was about having an induced near-death experience inside these buildings, which is very dangerous. Your body would be inside a box, and then you, your soul has actually left the body, and you've gone astral traveling, but you are physically at that location. And that's what these temples were trying to tell you. They are the umbilical cords to the sky. Now, fast forward the story to 2008. NASA brings out a press release, and I remember it to this very day because they dare to use the words magnetic portal. Now, when NASA does that, I pay attention. And they said, and I quote, um, there are magnetic portals uh, on the face of the Earth that open every 18 minutes, and they go up above the ionosphere. They connect with an another kind of serpent uh, line above the ionosphere, they create these X points and they go and connect to the sun and God knows where else. So we're now beginning to realize what in 8000 BC, the Vedas in India were trying to tell us. They were describing how there are these serpents that slide along the earth, which are mirrored in the sky, which are the arrows of the sorcerers. The arrow being the movement of uh, vibration from one uh, person or one entity to another level of reality. And the sorcerer is someone who connects with the source of things. So the source of energy, for example. So yes, I think that the next level of metaphor for the umbilical cord is the fact that they also are just terrestrial cords. They're also going that way. So you've got to think four dimensionally here all the time, just like the ancients used to do. Now, uh, and let's take it a, a step further. When I see uh, computer-generated graphics in uh, a movie and they are representing, and it doesn't matter, uh, it's you pick the movie, but when they show a wormhole, it looks like an umbilical cord. And exactly. it, it, the, it, I, I cannot get that out of not only... 
the outside and the twisting natural, you know, biological shape to it. There's that, but there's also the fact that they're traveling on the inside of it and and there's movement going in a direction and and I can't get that out of my mind. And then some of the uh, latest images from NASA showing these star clusters um, in different wavelengths that are connected yeah. uh, with with these with these tube like streams of of energy that look like umbilical cords. It's and we're now developing the technology that is able to actually visualize those uh, tubes as well, which is why that NASA press release was so important and hardly anyone's paid any attention to it. But of course, you know, being curious, I latched right onto it because I realized they just validated what these people have been saying for thousands of years, that there are these tubes that uh, not they're not just out there. They're also here on Earth. Right. We now right. know they exist at certain hot spots on the face of the Earth. And those hotspots tend to be uh, where the temples exist. So these are linking to other um, um, umbilical cords. And God knows where else they're going. I don't think we developed the technology to go that far. But if in 2008 we could actually see that these tubes open between the Earth and the sun and they connect and send information between these two bodies, then it's not the only place where they're going. The, uh, the mention, okay, so, in fact, if I can just follow that thought for a second. Yeah, here, absolutely. I, I just remembered something. Um, Osiris, our friend Osiris, who is the uh, physical uh, embodiment of, of Orion on the face of the earth in Egypt. Um, if you go to the temple of Dendera uh, and also at uh, Abydos and a couple of others, Edfu as well, uh, you see him riding a solar boat uh, with another group of gods. And uh, if you know about the mysteries of, of uh, Osiris, it's to do with the resurrection of the individual, uh, because Osiris embodies the individual who is challenged. He's chopped up uh, into little pieces by 72 co-conspirators, which makes you wonder why does it take 72 people to kill a guy? And there's a clue in the number, by the way. Um, they were telling the story that when this individual uh, dies, he is reborn as Horus. Uh, he is he's the one that's gone into the other world and he's come back. And you see him on his solar boat with a group of deities going towards the Milky Way, which in every culture in the world is the river that connects from here through to the next world. And the doorway is usually somewhere around the belt of Orion. Well, look at the boat and the way it's shaped, and especially the horns of the boat. They look exactly like the, the petals of the opening that we used to describe how the wormholes connect from A to B. They also have these sort of tulip shape at either side, and then they form this kind of boat. So in very simple diagrammatic form, the hieroglyphs with, with uh, Osiris on his boat riding the celestial river, the Milky Way, is telling you a very scientific concept, that he's riding this tube that goes from here to the other world and, and back and, as yeah, well. Yes, and when I look at those uh, images, I've always thought, it hit me from the front, and now I can't get away, time travel. There's 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 something there. The stars are represented in the way that he's uh, steering it. He's got his hands on levers and and things. I don't know, man. It's almost like time machine, but wormhole, right? <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, the the these aspects and and that that's what I see there. Um, now let's let you. It may, you well, it may even explain why some of these people in the old days lived to the ripe old age of eight hundred. I mean, the Ra was described in the Egyptian text as being uh, 800 years of age, and he's portrayed as a, a, an old man with his head like this with drool coming out of the side of his mouth. And his son is saying, like, Dad, I'm already 600. Do you think that I could have a go at being the pharaoh? How did they, what kind of calendar were they using that they were living such outrageously long ages? Was it because they were spending a lot of time on another level of reality, they're going somewhere else. They would come here to Earth to have a vacation. Uh, and, you know, wherever they were, they would spend an X amount of time, by which time they came back to Earth. A long, uh, hundreds of years would have gone by mm -hmm, uh, because mm -hmm. wherever they were living, their state of rotation around their home star was very different to the Earth. I mean, it's worth postulating these things because they didn't just make these numbers up because they could. I think they were making it up because it was actually real. You mentioned uh, when we started to uh, have a conversation about Gobekli Tepe in the last segment, you mentioned the Anunnaki uh, uh, being involved in that area. You also mentioned Giza. 
Um, this is something that isn't really talked about, even in some of our fringe circles. Can we go back and connect those dots for a second? What is the relationship of the Anunnaki and the Armenian highlands? Um, the people of Anu, which is basically the god of the sky, were also uh, going by different variants in that region. Uh, language changes depending on your geographical location. So uh, Anu becomes Ani in other parts of Persia. It also becomes Ar and Ara the further north you go towards the mountains. But they're the same entity. It's this androgynous god of creation from which uh, the whole universe comes from. And then, of course, you have people uh, in physical form that also represent that here on Earth. So the people that um, uh, Enoch talks about, in fact, uh, just for the record, uh, his real name is not Enoch. That was the Hebrew version. Uh, the real name is Emed Ur-Anu. That was the guy that wrote the book of Enoch. So he was one of the Anu himself. And uh, they are describing an area somewhere north of Mesopotamia. Uh, and the reason I'm saying this is because if you look at the original stories very carefully, just sit back for a little bit and read them without prejudice and, and without reference to Sitchin, by the way, because I have to say he got a lot of it wrong. He got a lot of it right, but he also got a lot of it wrong. And it steered us down this wrong road. And I've been sitting back for years looking at this objectively. I'm going, wait a minute. Emed Ur-Anu is describing how kingship descends to the lower plains of Mesopotamia to create the people that we know as the Sumerians. Well, we have now discovered that there's a cultural layer that exists below the Sumerian cultural layer. And that cultural layer came from the highlands of Armenia, and it precedes Sumer. So... If you put the uh, story of Enoch on the back of that, he describes how he was going progressively further and further north and further higher up in elevation. And I begin to realize that what he's describing is the volcanic region around Mount Ararat. And uh, once I contacted a few of the scholars around Armenia, they said, actually, it's quite true because the stories actually came here because they predate any other um, civilization in this immediate region. Um, the Armenian people and the people of Ara and Aru, which are the Anu, okay, depending on which part of that world you're living in, mm -hmm. uh, you're rolling your N's or you're rolling your R's, uh, they basically formed this ancient uh, parallel civilization, which then gave rise to the Sumerian civilization. So when they talk about the kingship being lowered from heaven, it's a bit of a cultural misinterpretation by the early translators who misinterpreted this in terms of a heaven. They came from a higher plateau to the lower regions. Now, the connection with Egypt is that, one, the, the Shining Ones followers of Horus of Egypt have the same nickname, Shining Ones, that the, Aku, uh, the Anu used to have as well. They were also extremely tall, just like the Anu were. They also were very light-skinned. They were also red-haired with green eyes and sometimes blonde with blue eyes. There was intermarriage between the two, and they had the same uh, ability to travel across uh, great distances in the ocean. And they also have another group of scholars around them called the Watchers, or the Lookers, as the Hopi used to call them. So there are multiple points of overlay in terms of the Egyptian culture and the uh, people that came from the Armenian highlands, uh, the Anunnaki. Now, uh, the let's talk about uh, Sumerian text and language for a second. Who spoke, what culture spoke and wrote Sumerian? Were there Sumerian people? No, uh, there's no such thing as Sumerian people. They were the people of Kengir. Uh, it's, uh, Su Sumerians were people who spoke the language of Sumer which came from Subartu, which is the region immediately to the north, which is the uh, old Armenian land of the Subartian people, who then becomes the Urartian people. It's very, very confusing. It took me weeks to unravel uh, all of these different cultures, but essentially it's the same region of the Armenian highlands. Uh, once you move at 1,000 or 2,000 years in one direction, you've got the same people being called by something else. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like calling the the, Brit, the British, uh, whether they're Scots, Welsh, or Irish, or English, or Saxon, or Angles. Uh, it's the variation of the same theme. Uh, so the language of Sumer really came down before from the region around Lake Van, uh, which is the big lake in, uh, in Armenia today. Uh, and there are actually petroglyphs there just to the north around the Black Sea, which are Sumerian writing, which precedes that that was found in Sumeria. So it was already 
extant in that part of the world before it descended from the high, uh, you know, the kingship descended to the lower regions of the Mesopotamian plain to create the people who spoke the language of Sumer. So that's pretty much where, you know, things got a little bit squiffy and it's taken me a few years to try and unravel this, but it's only by understanding the where the Armenian story comes from that suddenly the pins are starting to fall into place. Right, and so uh, let's let's summarize the Sumerians. <laughs> They'll be attached to this. Yes, and, and you get a free and, guitar if you get it right. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to. Uh, e, e, yeah, yeah. Um, is e, e, okay. So um, for the audience, and especially you know, when we thank Sitchin uh, for not only his important work, but it, allowing he this discussion rise. to take place, right? Of course. Yeah, he have not rise to this. And, and so when we talk about Sumerian text on the Sumerian tablets, who was creating those tablets? That's, that's the important, I mean, who, and we know what, you know, it's Mesopotamia and it's Iraq and it's, it's, you know, the, the, the river. Okay. We understand, but who was the actual culture itself uh, that created the Sumerian text? So that would have been the culture of Kengir, uh, which, of course, is the, what we call the Sumerian culture, which, by the way, means the land of the noble lords. So these are the people that were already noble, the people of Anu, who were the noble people already in the highlands. So those tablets are correct. They are Sumerian, but read them very carefully. For example, uh, there's the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a, a bestseller back in its day. But you know, uh, Gilgamesh was a, a real historical figure. We can date him. But look at the story very carefully. He, a historical figure, has been put uh, mingling about with events that happened 8,000 years before him. So whoever wrote that story, because remember, he's, in, he's hanging out with people in, uh, in the middle of the flood. Well, the flood took place in 9,700 BC. Um, he, he was around, what, 2,000 BC, if I'm not mistaken. So you've already got a span of 7,000 years before, uh, between the, when these events took place and when Gilgamesh actually existed. So what's happening here is that the story of Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, is the story of a very ruthless, vainglorious leader who is given a number of obstacles that he has to overcome in order to better himself. He is essentially the precursor of the Arthurian story, you know, the hero that has to overcome 12 obstacles in order to become enlightened so he can marry the bride. It's, uh, it's all kinds of layers of metaphor. But the writer of the Epic of Gilgamesh in 2000 BC took a historical figure and puts him in contact with the events that were already 7,000 years old by their time. So they inherited another piece of information and they used that as a backdrop in which to glorify depending on your point of view, this ruler. And in fact, a lot of the, the tablets that you read, uh, for example, is the Eridu Genesis, uh, that did not take place during the Sumerian times because it talks about the creation of the universe and how the universe is then mirrored as a physical creation on Earth, where the Earth becomes abundant with life, and then the Sumerian culture is born of that. Well, that's take, that, you've just basically described a process that's taken billions of years mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. condensed it in a few tablets. So you see, uh, these things were written after the event, and sometimes they were even, when you get to the Babylonian tradition, uh, they even had a few political maneuverings of themselves, so that by the time the Babylonians took over the Sumerian tablets, they had invested a few political and religious distortions of their own because they were much more superior than the people that came before them, of course, like everybody else. And then when the Hebrew people and the Israelites show up in captivity in Babylon, they take those stories, or they stole them according to the Babylonians, and they form the stories of the Old Testament. And by their time, they've changed the locations of the Old Testament. The gods are now the devils of the story. And uh, Enoch is suddenly removed and, and taken into the back of the Gospels as an apocryphal gospel. We can't sort of make it fit into the rest of the story that we're trying to create a culture for ourselves as being superior than the Babylonian. So everyone's trying to outdo out each other politically and religiously, but then again, everybody does that in history. So you've got to look at the context in which it's written, look at the story dispassionately without judgment, and realize that what they're doing is overlapping current events with events that took place a long, long time ago that we can actually define by geology and climatology. 
Now, when we come back, we're going to take our break right here. When we come back, we're going to get back to the shining ones. I'm going to continue to connect the dots. Somehow, I'm going to figure this out tonight, Freddie. I really appreciate it. Oh, my God. It. <laughs> I'm getting a headache already. <laughs> this is Fade to Black. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, VX. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts, and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie K. That's unxmedia.com. Why is it we're not very good with our health regiment? until it's too late. We don't put oil in the car until the engine blows up. When the body's out of balance, your health is not so good. Give your body some love. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Try our Life Change Tea, which cleanses you from harmful intruders. A clean colon is one of the ways to bring the body in balance. We also carry organic supplements to help you get where you need to go. So do your body a favor. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. You can even visit our sales page to save some dough. Uh, does anybody call money dough anymore? Anyway, if you're looking for short, helpful health tips, go to YouTube and punch in Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. So log on to GetTheTea.com, shop, get balanced, then learn some cool tips at Health Matters Now. You'll be glad you did. That's GetTheTea.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon coffee banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Promo code F2B blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. When you're in the house for longer periods of time, you can see them flying or running across the floor. Ooh, yuck. They're unhealthy, gross, and disgusting. Bugs. I loathe bugs. We keep a clean home, but occasionally bugs show up. Well, I found something that is tougher than bugs. Orange Guard. On contact, it kills hidden bugs, including ants, roaches, and fleas. Plus, Orange Guard is a residual repellent. All of the ingredients of Orange Guard are on the FDA generally recognized as safe list. Orange Guard may be used around food, humans, and pets. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Orange Guard, available at orangeguard.com, Whole Foods, and Ace Hardware. Gold loves chaos uncertainty and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about the stock market, we can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure, United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. 
This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Freddie Silva is with us during the break. Freddie was showing me his Ingve licks. And <laughs> Freddie, you're too much. Now, this conversation tonight, Freddie, is exactly why I enjoy doing this show. And um, I, I wa- now I need to, I need to circle back. I want to get to the shining ones again. How this all connects? Come on, Freddie, serious face, game face, very serious. Yeah, game you face. Know, you know, from now on, I think you should just have people on the show who can actually throw a chord or a shape with a guitar. Very yeah, important. yeah, that's uh, very important. It, it, it truly is. And <laughs> you know, and I um, and not to go off on a guitar tangent because it's uh, too easy for me to do. Um, the one thing that I enjoy um, hanging out with friends is is finding out more about them. And more often than not, we end up having a guitar conversation. And I really I really dig that. It's just like we don't have to talk uh, Anunnaki, you know, all night over dinner week and and which we did. We ended up talking uh, guitars uh, much to uh, probably the displeasure of some of the uh, our friends at that dinner table. <laughs> because it, it's so easy to do. They were looking at us very suspiciously. <laughs> the, um, but you know what, Jimmy? The yes. uh, original gods of Egypt, the Neter, you do, do you know what their uh, symbol is? A guitar. Is it, is it really? Yes. <laughs> How many strings? Is it four? Uh, yeah, it's like a sort of a, it, look, it looks like a sort of a Japanese guitar with four little pegs. Yes. And it has a, a little flag next to it. Yes, I've seen uh, that. Yeah, I've seen that. that. Yeah. I've seen that. And, and I often wonder what string gauges, you know, and how are, how, <laughs> how are they pulling that off? The, um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say this at, uh, and you and I were talking about this, uh, over the weekend, um, at the Met in in New York City, which has one of the most you know half of the building is is Egypt, right? And uh, that whole wing, when you walk in, you turn to the right and you're in Egypt land for three days, you know, until you come back out of it. But when you go through there and you start looking at um, uh, this is what I find inter is is the metallurgy. And you're looking at the dates of of these different things. It doesn't matter if it's sandals or, or you know, to, whatever. And you're looking at this metallurgy, and then you're looking at things like, you know, gold thread. You know, how? Wait, 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 wait! Whoa, whoa, whoa! You know, stop that! You know how how is that going down? I I don't get it. And so at the Met. Um, and we're gonna get to uh, we're gonna get to the Anunnaki and Egypt, and I'm gonna connect this back to Mars with you. Um, uh, we're gonna uh, circle back. But I'm at the Met, and there's this glass case, and in this glass case is a Stella, and the Stella is about two and a half feet tall. It's about this wide, you know, the round top, the flat bottom, and the hieroglyphics are a quarter inch tall beautiful right and there's thousands of them in these it's perfect you know and you're looking and i mean the hieroglyphics that you see at karnak but this big right it's yeah. like and and i'm looking and it's beautiful you know and it's rose granite and it's perfect and 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 so yeah. anyway i'm looking at it well, and this is to come. but but this is what they do this is the big lie so I'm looking at this and I'm so impressed how, you know, and then, and then you look and next to it, to the right is this little copper needle. It's like this long, right? And there's a card and it says this Stella was carved with this copper needle. And I'm looking at the needle and I'm looking at this rose <laughs> granite and the carving and I'm looking, I'm like, no, it wasn't. <laughs> that must be penance. So you're going to, you're going to sit there, you know, with a little needle tapping out this incredible Stella for like a hundred years. Yeah. 500 like years. A, yeah. A, a, a penance that they were doing. <laughs> yeah. And it's perfect. 
The yeah, hieroglyphics, I mean, they're perfect and they're engraved. And there's a copper chisel. No, no. The big lie. I mean, the ones that I adore are the ones that are made of uh, just slightly impressed hieroglyphs on diorite, which is the hardest rock on earth. Right, um, you right. Can't, you can't use copper on that at all. Uh, you have to use an alloy, if anything, or some other form. Diamond. Of Diamond is what you use. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, when, when uh, people, when, when the Greeks were going to um, Alexandria and hearing this from the Egyptian priest, they were, uh, I think Plato made a point about this as well, that, you know, he was saying that, uh, you know, the paintings that they have from 10,000 years ago, and he says, and I'm not talking loosely, I mean 10,000 years ago are as good as the work they're doing today. So there, there was a tradition that apparently were kept going in Egypt for a very long time, despite the uh, climatic challenges that they had over the, in the period that the country's been in existence. So it's been part of a very long tradition. And what amazes me more than anything else is that we rarely if ever find the instruments that they used to carve these beautiful things. That's what's really frustrating. It's like they foresaw the future and they, re and they reckoned, well, we need to give them something to think about. Let's hide the tools in case they uh, – just not, not to make it too easy for them. I was yeah. watching a documentary the other day, um, and this was on Nat Geo, and I'm not making a word of this up. They said these these words in Nat Geo, uh, what are the, uh, 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 Secrets of Egypt or whatever. It was just released, 2021. They said that, and they're showing the Great Pyramid, and they said each worker used up to eight copper chisels per block per day. Now, wait a minute. A lot of so yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> you know, four and a half million stones, right? Eight chisels each. Somewhere in Giza are pits yeah. with millions of chisels in them. A lot Where, of blunt chisels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, blunt. Yeah. That, that they started off this big and... The, but yeah. uh, and and they just they just rattle this stuff off as fact and don't uh, uh, consider that some of us may actually think about yeah, what I they mean, are trying to the say. The logic doesn't really sink in. I mean, I mean, I, I've been to Egypt more times than I can count, and uh, each time I, I have a day off, I I go up to uh, from Mena House, I walk up the hill, and uh, the guards know me by now, and I try to fake. Uh, the fact that my watch has stopped uh, because I'm always late getting out of the Giza plateau. Uh, I hide behind things uh, and, and they think that the plateau is cleared and I can stay on for an extra hour or two and then fake surprise when I get to the guards and I just pay them off and said, sorry, my watch doesn't work. Oh, okay, my friend. And I keep looking at the, not so much the pyramids, but the temples adjacent to the pyramids and hardly anyone pays attention to the rock. Those temples, I think are even older than the pyramids because of the erosion and very clearly a lot of water erosion along these temples. Uh, the pyramid, uh, the temple of Menkari is my favorite. Nobody ever goes to the pyramid of Menkari. I think it's the most fascinating one uh, because, you know, we want the big thing. We want the, uh, you know, the, uh, something that you can show with a selfie on Facebook. No, the, in the ancient traditions, you always look at the small details because that's where the real gold is. Mm -hmm. And I, I and I'm looking at the um, the adjacent temple to Menkari's pyramid, and uh, the last time that that much water existed in that part of the world to create that kind of erosion was over eight thousand years ago. Okay, and what we see today, if you look very carefully at the blocks on top of the uh, the temple, they've been repositioned from something else as though a lot of water, and I mean a gigantic amount of water, and possibly earthquakes too, has toppled these enormous stones, which are over 400 tons each. I mean, these are half baleback sized things, mm -hmm. and they've been put back on top of an even older rock that's even eroded and then they've put other rocks from other parts of the temple on top of this the whole thing is a big mess as though they kept rebuilding and rebuilding and rebuilding and then it abuts the uh, wall of Menkaure's pyramid and you look at those original granite uh, casting stones you can see and this is where people start getting into arguments they're saying, well, look at how bad the workmanship was. Look at how badly fitting these blocks of granite are. I said, yes, but you, what, what you don't realize is that what you're looking at is not the fitting. 
that is the corners of the, of the stones that have been eroded by water coming down the slopes of the pyramid. And next to it, you'll have a big area. I want to say it's about 30 feet by 30 feet square where the stone is absolutely perfectly polished, but cut like indented like this. I don't know why there's four sides of the, on the, uh, um, on the pyramid of Menkari that are like this. And someone has come along and re-chiseled the granite about this deep. And, it, it, and you can see the seams are back to what, where they used to be. You can't slide a camel hair between those rocks now. Mm -hmm. But it's the same stone. It's been resurfaced, and I think that's what the pharaohs were doing later on in the uh, historical period, because that shows that it hasn't been eroded in 4,000 years when Menkari was around, that, because then the, uh, there was no rain back then. It was just wind, and that shows the consistent weathering of wind with 4,000 years on granite, which is not very much, very negligible. But all around it, you can see how the same stones have big gaps and they're all curved. That's the erosion of a lot of water. So it gives you an idea that the pyramids were refashioned and retooled from age to age. So both sides of the story, I think, are quite correct. I think that the pharaohs did kind of build the pyramids, but they didn't really. They were refurbishing what yes, was already well, taking I, I place. Think, I, I it's think, a big uh, difference between building and refurbishing. Yeah, uh, Makari, uh, Kafre, and Khufu and their engineers, uh, there are text and 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 notes uh, in history that clearly state, and this is where I just go, aha, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're here to repair. We need exactly. to come in and, and fix this stuff up. Well, if you just built it, what are you doing repairing it? Exactly. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, you know, somebody explain that to me. I will start my tour, not at the, at the pyramids, which frustrates all the people on the tour because they're desperate to go up on the plateau of and course. look at the pyramids. I said, no, I wouldn't let you, I wouldn't dream of letting you any of those buildings until we've seen the whole of Egypt to put these buildings into perspective. We start at the very bottom of the Valley Temple to look at erosion. And uh, there's a couple of blocks which have not been pillaged to build modern day Cairo. I mean, literally, if you go to uh, downtown Old Cairo and you're very observant and look around the uh, facades of the buildings, you'll see hieroglyphs on the sides of the buildings, of, of buildings that were only there, what, six, 700 years ago? Those were the, 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 the um, stones, with the, the casing stones from the pyramids, because like the ancient tradition said, the pyramids were carved with hieroglyphs. They were, they were covered with hieroglyphs, and one Arab chronicler said, uh, there are so many hieroglyphs on the face of the two uh, main pyramids that in order to transcribe the faces, it would take over 8,000 sheets of paper. That's an actual quote from an, uh, one of the early Arab, Arab um, people. But when you look at the Valley Temple, there's a couple of uh, granite-facing stones which have been left, left there from the time of Khafre. And you can see that they were trying desperately to rebuild the Valley Temple because the stone behind it is unbelievably worn limestone. And it's been underwater. It's been uh, eroded by water. And also, of course... Uh, the uh, Sphinx enclosure has also been very, very worn by water coming off the slopes of the Giza Plateau. And the last time that happened was over 8,000 uh, years ago, 10,000 years ago. So there's been a, cons a, a consistent rebuilding of these sites and complete reworking, which is why when you read the Stella in between the pores of the Sphinx, it says the Pharaoh is in service to Osiris. That means you are following a tradition. Uh, it's your responsibility to maintain that tradition. And that tradition means rehabbing, refurnishing, and maintaining the integrity of the temple, which, of course, falls apart because of the, uh, the nature of not just the um, weather, but also the fact that you're in a very dangerous rift zone along the Nile. And they do suffer from very bad earthquakes. Doesn't the dream, Stella? I, I need to get to Mars. Okay, we need to circle back to Mars. Well, we oh, well, we've I'm got one more in five minutes. Yeah, so, uh, we've got, take we, it with me. Yeah, we've got <laughs> we've got another segment that uh, we can squeeze that into. But doesn't the dream, Stella, uh, specifically mention two sphinxes? Uh, it, it's uh, it's a matter of uh, interpretation, uh, and uh, I can't really sort of put my finger on it because I tend to look at these things metaphorically because that's what the ancients were so wonderful at doing. They layered the information in front of people so that when you read something literally, like most people tend to do, mm -hmm. they'll go, oh, literally, there's, there's two the sphinx there, there's a sphinx there. It shows you uh, two holes of records. 
Yes, but that's the first layer of interpretation. The deeper meaning of these things, which are always veiled in symbol and metaphor, was that one is a mirror of the other. There's a real, uh, there's a, a real sphinx, and then there's a metaphoric sphinx, an invisible one. Just like there's, there's a physical world and there's a spiritual world. Everything is a mirror image of something else, and that's the way I'm beginning to look at it. Uh, not that there were two sphinxes, but there was one is the one that exists that we see, and the other one is the one we don't see. The hidden tradition, which of course is what lies underneath, that's the that that sort of is the metaphor for what is hidden below the surface. You have to dig below the surface to get at the real nugget of gold. Um, whether there was physically a, sec a second sphinx, there is. I mean, I've read the accounts of uh, a couple of researchers who are suggesting that there's a couple of headlands of uh, limestone along the Giza Plateau that are highly suggestive that there may have been a second one. And that would not be against Egyptian tradition because there would have been a kind of gateway to frame whatever was rising on the horizon. And this wasn't just the Rhine. There was also... Um, what we'll call it a Leo, the constellation of Leo, these things would have formed the doorway in order for the energy to come onto the Giza plateau. That would have been consistent with their thinking to have two elements which would have formed a doorway from the so that the energy of whatever object they were looking at would penetrate the temple on the Giza plateau. So are you saying Again, one work in progress? <clears throat> one facing east and, and the, another one on the west side? I would suggest that there would have been two facing the east because rarely did anything ever get uh, celebrated going over the uh, uh, going back under the horizon. That's a death position. The ancients, uh, practically ninety nine point nine percent of the time, celebrating the rising of objects or their mid heaven position, sure. never the sinking below the horizon. So my guess would be that there would have been a doorway framed by two features that would have allowed the energy of maybe it was leo maybe it was a rhyme maybe it was something else that we still haven't quite gotten to yet right. that would have framed the entry of energy that would have then shaped the framework of the entire temple structure on the giza plateau and i and i've seen that all around the world again uh, in different uh, formats now let's talk about uh, osiris um the the entrance to uh, the osiris tomb is precisely located where? Well, we don't know. Um, I mean, there's a, a lot has been said about the Osiris shaft, but that was just something that a name that uh, Zawi Hawass gave to it. Um, if I'm reading the traditions uh, correctly, Osiris is actually buried somewhere on the hills around Abydos. Uh, and it's not the Osirian, by the way. Uh, the Osirian is actually dedicated to his mistress, Isis. Uh, you got to go to the temple above to read that story. Well, uh, who's, so there's a well, big okay. mystery about uh, 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 um, the, the reason why there was such a big tradition celebrating Osiris Abydos is because he was buried somewhere on the hills. I don't think we found the original place yet. Well, wait a minute. Okay, so now I'm really confused. It's always Hawass that you messes things be. up. Um, yeah, no, okay. he made up the story about the, uh, the, the, the Osiris shaft. shaft. Right. It has nothing whatsoever to do with Osiris. Well, nothing. who's Sarah? Sarcophagus is that down there? There is a box down there. Whether there's anybody buried in it to begin with, um, who knows? I mean, if you've been down there, it's a long way down. It's a couple of hundred feet. Why would you go down there to steal bones? It doesn't make any sense. But there was another story that I've read which talks about a number of people, and the uh, most recent was in historical times when they were looking for a place called the Inventory. Uh, it was a place that was, and now you have to go back to before the flood, 300 years before the flood. So we're in 10,000 uh, BC, and the Pharaoh has a dream. Uh, he sees these burning objects coming out of the sky uh, and the entire earth covered with water. And he wakes up in a cold sweat, gathers all the astronomer priests and says, listen, I want you to take a measurement of the stars and let me know if the dream I had is prophetic. And the God of Wisdom, Jehuti, who the Greeks called Toph, um, he says, actually, it's quite true. There are objects, big comets coming this way. And in 300 years of our time, they are going to collide with the earth. And, he's, and the Pharaoh orders Jehuti to build a repository so that all the information that they've gathered over 20, 29,000 years at that point will be kept safely. And I'm beginning to suspect, having been down these shafts, uh, which are incredibly way below the, so far below the ground that you think, why would you have to go 200 to 300 feet to bury someone? It's overkill. 
The only reason why I would bury something that deep would be to protect it from harm and put it in boxes which are not only airtight, but watertight. And the classic room, that, and I wrote about this uh, in my last book, um, I, I, I posited that the Serapeum, which is the uh, that wonderful series of tunnels where supposedly bulls were buried, which right. is basically a lot of bull, they, yes. they found two bones. And in fact, there's only one person, actually two people buried there, and one of them is the uh, f- uh, f- the son of Tutmosis III, who was a, a rehabber of these places. He loved that place. And the way that the place has been carved very, very quickly, if you look very carefully, go to the Valley of the Kings, and you've, you realize that those are tombs. Those are real tombs. They are beautifully decorated. They honor people. The Serapeum is being hacked out of the limestone as though someone is running out of time and those boxes have been brought 400 miles. They've been shaped on site, and they're absolutely airtight and watertight, according to Christopher Dunn. And I agree with him on this. And there's no way all that effort was made to bury a bunch of bulls. I really do believe that all of these underground places around the Giza Plateau, all the way to the Serapeum, were built to house very specific things, scrolls. Who knows, technology maybe, because 8,000 years later, the pharaohs were still looking for these rooms. And today, when you go to the Serapeum and the Osiris, Osiris shaft, someone has moved the lid, taken something out, and boom, disappeared. We don't know where it went. All that we know is that soon after this occurred, they, uh, a lot of maps showing places like Antarctica, which is ice-free, which is something that hasn't happened for over 23,000 years, suddenly appear all around the Mediterranean. So my suggestion is that these deep shafts with these boxes were actually the places that they call the inventory rooms, where they literally put the inventory of everything that they had gathered and accumulated over 23,000 years charts, stories, scrolls, technology. Uh, They talked about metal that does not rust and glass that you can bend and then it bends back to its original shape. This is one of the pharaohs writing about this. Uh, Sorry, it's it's Caliph al-Mamun in the 12th century that was writing about this. He was looking for the same stuff. So I believe that these were places where they stored something that was so important that they made sure it was not going to be destroyed by flood or earthquake or anything. And that would account for these things being so far under the ground because, I mean, really, uh, it is very overkill if you, when you go and see these things. Now, uh, uh, one minute before the break, and then we'll just continue uh, when we come back. Uh, the, the Osiris shaft, does it end uh, at, at 300 feet, which is a football pitch, right? That is, that's a long ways. Uh, yeah. it, does it continue? What, what is down there? Uh, there are other chambers, there are other tunnels, and essentially there's a whole village, in fact, it's a whole city. And uh, I know people who, in the archaeological world who prefer not to talk about it because they can't explain it. And you can literally walk all the way from Giza underground to Saqqara, 14 miles away. So when you go to Saqqara and you see those deep shafts, that's the end of the tunnels of Giza. So there's an entire underground city under there, and they don't want to talk about it because they can't explain it. But every year, archaeologist knows about it. Even my guide in Egypt, my official guide, knows about them. And they said, yeah, I mean, I used to go there as a girl. We used to play down there, and you can only go so far because you can only take a torch so far. And then the air gets very vitiated because a lot of it's collapsed because of earthquakes. So in Saqqara, they're now digging the tunnels. For example, they just opened the the shaft where um, uh, the, the actual tomb uh, of uh, uh, oh god now I've forgotten the uh, the pharaoh's name underneath the step pyramid anyway the one that's there it's late at night for me um, that is the bottom of the uh, the end of the uh, the shaft that go all the way under all the way back to Giza and uh, they're beginning to clean up the debris and they're realizing this is connected to something much much bigger uh, and I had the privilege of talking to the archaeologist there who's actually a very nice and open-minded gentleman and he's doing a lot of work and uh, I've been to some of those uh, shafts and again burial doesn't even begin to uh, to answer this because it's overkill you can bury someone 20 feet under the ground mm-hmm. and be done with it uh, you don't have to go 300 feet to carve the bedrock and then all these uh, side chambers and all kinds of unusual rooms where there's nothing there it's almost as if they're all service entrances to something else 
14 miles. Let's take our break. We'll come back and get into overtime with Freddie Silva. He's got scotch. He's got a guitar. We've got one segment left. This, <laughs> this is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. More with Freddie when we come back after this short break. Stay with us. Listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. Hey, what up, y'all? It's your girl Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy Jimmy Church on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. This is Jimmy Church. Jason Martell's book, Knowledge Apocalypse, 10-Year Anniversary Edition, is now available. Most ancient cultures speak of a time when their gods visited them. They never say their gods came from across the ocean or from the mountains. They always came down from the skies. Was ancient man visited by gods or extraterrestrials? We have not been told the full truth about our human past. There was a time when all the ancient cultures lived amongst beings they considered their gods. The search for truth leads us down the path of learning where the ETs might come from and why they are here. To understand some of these advanced topics and learn the truth about human origins, buy the new book from Jason Martell, Knowledge Apocalypse. Now in its 10-year anniversary edition available on Amazon.com by clicking on the banners over on our site or simply visit JasonMartell.com. That's JasonMartell.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one-year anniversary. That's right, one year. And as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. 
you'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Freddy's out of control. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Heading into overtime tonight on Fade to Black with Freddy Silva. That's Freddy playing uh, the bumper music. Uh, most people uh, don't know that. Uh, going into overtime and, and with uh, the limited time that we have left, I want to circle back to uh, the Sedonia Avebury uh, uh, thing uh, b- before... Well, it's got you thinking, isn't it? Well, here, but here's the thing: the the Anunnaki story, certainly as uh, presented by Sitchin and others, uh, talk about uh, uh, the Mars connection, them being there, uh, coming here to Earth, um, worlds in collision, and everything else that was going on. Okay, so. Um, but that is a very deliberate connection. And if we go back to your overlay that you were mentioning earlier, are we talking about uh, the Anunnaki and, and the Shining Ones traveling from Mars to Earth? Um, they didn't. Well, uh, according to uh, David uh, Percy and David Myers, they didn't actually bring up the Anunnaki at all in their book. So I don't know what the connection would be. Um, if I, if I remember correctly, I don't think they even gave him a name, uh, to these people. They just said that, uh, this, this, this event would have taken place, you know, a few million years ago as the uh, planet is losing its atmosphere, as Mars is facing a terrible catastrophe, uh, climatically. So they are, they're coming here to the earth to essentially rebuild the mansions that they had on Mars, which is kind of funny because the Egyptians, also mentioned exactly the same thing in their story that uh, just before the uh, end, the beginning of the younger Dryas, when they know they're up against uh, uh, problems um, and the sea levels are already rising, that they actually were scouting Egypt as a location and on which to build, and I quote, the future historic temples to rebuild the former mansions of the gods. So the temples that we see today are literally mirror images of those that are now under the ocean somewhere else around the world. Uh, And that's very categorically stated in the mythical origins of the Egyptian temple, which is, again, another difficult uh, book to wrap your head around. This is an evening of difficult books to wrap your head around. Yes, it (laughs) is. It is. But but I don't believe Myers and Percy made the connection with the Anunnaki in their particular research. And uh, and, and, uh, what about uh, the... Uh, and I've had so many guests on this show to take me through the history of the Anunnaki and and uh, Enki and and this battle, the sibling rivalry that was <laughs> that was happening between Mars and and Earth and and those considerations. Is that oh, why not? I mean, uh, look at the uh, the gods of the Greeks. I mean, talk about a dysfunctional family. But at the same time, we have to now weigh the option of whether they are, we are witnessing a eyewitness event, a historical description of what was going on, or are we given morality tales using metaphors of behavior? Uh, I tend to read them. Um, uh, this is where in, personal interpretation comes in, and I tend to read them a lot as uh, as uh, moral stories, and certainly, the, for example, the story of Enki and Enlil, where, where Enki 
uh, uh, he sort of marries his mother and out of that union comes the vegetation of the earth. Uh, you know, we, so essentially, it, it, I don't think that's actually what happened physically. I think he's just saying that Enki represents a god of uh, agriculture who then marries the goddess of the universe. And through that union, you have a planet that's made fertile. And from that, you have the animals that, are, uh, that appear out of that. Then you have the human race that is born in the kind of mirror image of the gods because he was saying, well, it would be great that we create the universe but who's going to look after the physical world specifically the earth can't we build a race of people out of the clay of the earth with a drop of our blood so in a sense it's like we carry the divinity in our blood of the original concept of creation but being the ancients they also would have used uh, the story is a metaphor to tell you about real people who lived historically who also portrayed what the gods were doing because it was the, the as above so below just because you're talking about a uh, metaphoric concept about how creation is made does not mean that people here on earth also didn't have the chance to reproduce that same effect here uh, and embody those qualities in physical form. So there's a multi-layer uh, story that's going on here, and you've got to be very careful sort of not to confuse the two. Uh, for example, uh, Enlil, who's always given a bit, a bit of a hard time. But the funny thing is, if you look at the stories of Enlil, he becomes a real bastard only during the Babylonian uh, era. That's when they twisted him into a god of authority, mm -hmm. and they used him as a symbol of god of war. And then he becomes overlaid with Yahweh, who's the Bedouin god of war, which then the Hebrews used to create their pillar of their religion. Uh, which, of course, when you use the god of war as your pillar for your religion, it's not going to end very well. Uh, but the, if you look at the original story of Enlil, back to the original Sumerian tablets, which, again, are... Uh, following on from an earlier culture, uh, he essentially also uh, makes love to his mother, makes the earth uh, um, very abundant with uh, civilization. He becomes the god of agriculture. And where he goes wrong is where he seduces the goddess of grain. And for that transaction, he gets sent to the underworld as a punishment. And the, there's a moral in the story that if you over... Uh, step the bounds of nature and if you rape nature uh, against its will there will be consequences to pay for that so you see the story is uh, both metaphoric symbolic and also uh, um, descriptive of people who in physical world would embody those qualities so in the end it's almost like you're reading a play of many parts which gives you a kind of a moral code by which to live by and of course, as the story goes, gets closer and closer to the historical era, it gets more and more diluted and more twisted by, for political and, of course, religious purposes. So that's why it's always important to go back to the original text as much as you can, because you stand a better chance that you'll get closer to the, the truth and the unadulterated truth at that. Well, with your research and as uh, things start to uh, circle back on to itself. Right now, we've got perseverance on Mars. We've got Elon Musk, uh, who is bound <laughs> and determined uh, to build a city there and 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 get uh, humans there ASAP. And we're talking about soon. We're in 2022, and they're talking about 2026 and 27 and 28. Well, you uh, better hurry up then. Well, but <laughs> would it surprise you? to close the book on some of this it's one thing to have a rover you know with a little scoop on it digging digging in the rocks but it's another thing to put to put to put humans there where they can uh, take a look around would I it surprise agree. And you i think there's going to be, i don't think anybody's actually thought about this properly i mean think about it we're creatures of the earth on a planet that revolves around a 24-hour period we need to sleep too now, what's going to happen when you put humans on a planet where I can't remember what the revolution is around the sun, but isn't it like a 38-hour day or something like yes, that? Yes, it is. It is. We are not going to be able to cope with that psychologically for to begin with. So I don't think anyone's actually addressed that. Well, what what is going to happen if they discover something extraordinary, like the real deal, you know, something... And yeah. I, 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 and I'm being very serious, uh, speaking in metaphors. But what if they look down and find a can of Coke, you know, or or just something that is, you know, some out of place object exactly. that is not supposed to be there? What are we going to do with that? 
And the irony of the uh, the whole thing, uh, when I was uh, finishing off the uh, the missing lands, I was facing the same predicament that we we seem to be reaching a point in our development, in our history, where we've gone through um, 12,000 years since the flood. And we're now reaching exactly the same uh, problems that uh, these people were faced with, the gods were faced with back then, except back then it was for different reasons. Now it's more like self-induced reasons. Right, right. But I think that there's a mirror image going on here. And this is where the new age comes in very handy because everything is a mirror of everything else. And I kept reading the stories about the Anunnaki, who, by the way, are the same people as Viracocha and his Hai Hai Wapanti in South America. You've got to ask the Ayamara, what does Hai Hai Wapanti mean? They mean, they said, it means the shining ones. So the Anunnaki were always, were all around the world using different names. So, the, you know, the names get changed locally, of course, but they mean exactly the same thing. And uh, the one thing that struck me was that they came, uh, their, their lands are sinking, their island homes are sinking, the sea levels are rising. They have no option but to get onto the continental shelf and hang out with humans and hunter-gatherers who are less developed. And uh, so from the reading of the bits that we have left in the, uh, the scriptures around the world, it's very clear that they were very keen to give the surviving humans the accoutrements of civilization. They showed us what to do, and then they just disappeared. Where did they go? We don't know. Did they go back to Orion? Uh, they certainly weren't going uh, back to their island homes because there were not much of them left. They were going under the ocean. Um, and um, so I just wonder if they disappeared, uh, whether they, uh, they drowned, they went back to Orion, whether they went back to another dimension, we don't know. But they vanished. And I wondered if they left us with the instructions, with the manual to get on and build our own civilization and then help us from the sides because they appear here and there at times when we really lose the plot and it gives it a little shove in the right direction all the time. And, uh, and the Hopi will agree with this, by the way, because they're in contact with them almost monthly. And um, I wondered if the whole point of the last stage in this uh, uh, development from the Ice Age till now has been for us to try and be just like the gods. And that this time, instead of falling into catastrophe, which we're facing, I wonder if right now we have the, the tools to avert that catastrophe. And wouldn't it be great if in that moment where we are facing more meteorites coming out of the sky, which NASA and a lot of mathematicians are very adamant that between 2032 and 2042, the chances of us being hit by very large chunks that are, are flying through the torrid meteor shower every November are very, very, the, the odds are very high. And in fact, in one major crop circle that appeared in, uh, let's see, 1996, it does show the solar system in absolute accuracy with the Earth missing, and it does give us a date of 2038 with the Earth missing. I've been sitting on this information for 20 years, not realizing what we were given. And of course, the beings that were making the original crop circles were calling themselves the Watchers. So we're back full circle to this story, mm -hmm. and we've now ha we're now facing the same situation of total destruction, but I think we have the tools within mm -hmm. us to try and avert that. And I'll tell you what it is, without giving too much away at the end of the book. Um, we have done experiments uh, around the world to measure consciousness. We have the machinery to do this. And one of the most famous experiments was at Princeton, uh, the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Department, which no longer exists. And they had these experiments where they put a group of people of like mind in a room and they said, I want you to focus on this box. And this box is a computer. And the computer has a beep, like a drum beat. And after a certain amount of training, these people looked and took their intent to the machine and they were able to alter the drum beat of a computer. Now, if we can do that to a machine, think of what we could do with a group of people who could basically take the intent and move a whole bunch of rocks out of the sky. Whereas, you know, 11,000 years ago, we were faced with the opposite, where the rocks were coming to the earth to wipe everything out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very poetic way to round this story off because we've come now full circle to become the gods that we were basically given the instructions to become. It's like the Hopi said, we're the ones we've been waiting for. 
and uh, the gods are always around. We have UFO sightings. We have manifestations of these unusual beings always around the world throughout the historical period. If you just care to look at the information, it's all there. And they seem to be appearing at strategic moments in our development. It just gives a little nudge in the, the right direction. But of course, as every Star Trek fan knows, there's a prime directive in the universe. It's called the law of non-intervention. You cannot intervene in the development of another species unless you've been asked for for help, and then you do it subtly. And this is why the crop circles are filling in this gap in information. And I can tell you, going back to exotic numbers, and this comes out of two-thirds, by the way, and my involvement with Percy and Myers, who helped me understand the picture on the cover of my first book, Secrets in the Fields, where the crop circle with the tetrahedron has a, a kind of a, a line that doesn't quite meet. And, of course, right. the, uh, the people were saying, the, uh, the skeptics were saying, well, it's a man-made thing, there's an error. No, that error is the angle of 19.47 degrees, which allows you to create a three-dimensional shape from that picture. And there's three groups of scientists, one in England, one in Oklahoma, and one in uh, Australia, who have built that design in 3D. And guess what? It defies gravity. And one of the, uh, the uh, pieces of information we were given by the watchers early on in the crop circle phenomenon is that the crop circles encode new methods of propulsion, which have to do, and I quote, with the illusion of gravity. So they're helping us with information. They're imprinting information. So the watchers, who are the craftspeople that used to surround the Anunnaki 12,000 years ago, are still around in some form, whether it's physical or non-physical, I'm not sure. But they're still giving us information to help us move forward beyond our perceived helplessness. So this is why I get very sort of almost angry when people start talking about the Watchers being bad people and the Anunnaki being bad people. Um, if they hadn't helped us at the end of the flood, the planet uh, would not have any humans in it right now. They helped us out of this mess. Uh, because at the time, what was happening was that there was a small group of renegade watchers, if you read the story, that defied orders, okay, only a small group def uh, defied orders, and they taught humans things they shouldn't have been doing right. to hunt the gatherers. And, that, uh, and through the mating of this renegade group, there were the bastard offspring, which were very tall uh, beings covered with red hair. And then their offspring were the Nephila, the children of Orion, and they were the problem. They were the ones that were eating humans for, for sport, uh, destroying the human race, and they were overpopulating the earth. And that's what um, – there was a meeting that was uh, took place between the lords of Anu that said – Humans haven't got a hope in hell because of the bastard offspring of the bastard watchers, the small group. Uh, and we have to wipe out these uh, red-haired tall giants because they're going to eat the human beings alive. It will be a, a planet of red-haired apes. That's it. So that's why they manufactured the flood to wipe everything out. But then they bailed out the survivors. And by the way, a lot of the gods also died during the flood. The Egyptians are very adamant about this. Uh, so the few surviving gods helped out the few surviving humans. And here we are having this conversation. Tastes, so we, tastes like a, chicken. A gratitude. Tastes like chicken. And, and, here's, <laughs> and here's the thing, though. Um, when we look at, uh, let's go back to Gobekli Tepe for just a minute. And I, we've just got a short time left. If we just go like back to, word, don't you? if we go, I, I cannot help but go back to <laughs> go back Lee Tappy. Go back Lee Tappy. Is this um, the, the it's Stone Age man, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about 10,500 BC. Stone Age man forging for seeds in the dirt, you know, wearing animal skins, um, had no concept of quarrying rocks, allegedly. Um, and an organization and logistics and agriculture, everything that would have to be in place for Gobekli Tepe to be built. Mm -hmm. They had to have been, that culture had to have been taught how to do these things. Yeah. Right? And so was that the shining start. ones that, that taught that culture at that time? Uh, it was to the tall people. Uh, there was tall people and then there was the giants. The giants were the offspring uh, who were basically the, um, uh, how would I call it, 
Um, this is where I realized it's almost one in the morning. Um, there, were the, there was a problem between the DNA of the Anu and the Watchers. That's why they were forbidden to mate with human women. And the, uh, the Wichita of Oklahoma still have this story that said that at one point that the, uh, these people tried to take uh, women for wives, uh, human women for wives, and a lot of the women just died during childbirth because they gave birth to infants. Uh, that the, there was a mismatch between the DNA and the fact that these people were eight and a half feet tall to begin with. Right. And whenever they succeeded, the uh, the infants were born and they soon outgrew their parents. So they were now truly giant tests. They were like 12 feet tall, 15 feet tall, uh, still living in the Solomon Islands to this very day, from what I understand from the villagers. And they just leave them alone. And they describe them that way. They're very tall people. They're massive people. They're covered in red hair. And the U.S. Um, Army people during the Second World War witnessed them when they were stationed there. So there's still remnants of these people still around. Now, uh, the new book, uh, let's talk about that for a quick second. I know that it's en route to me now. Um, uh, when does it uh, officially get released? What's the title? Oh, it was officially released in December because um, it's the only time I was at home to do it, the, the releasing. Uh, so hardly anyone's noticed it so far. So uh, after your show, I hope that there'll be a major bestseller like everything else. Uh, it's called Scotland's Hidden Sacred Past, which kind of takes this story a little stage further because no one really knows the origin of uh, the stone circles and uh, mystery towers in the western islands of Scotland, which is really where... Uh, civilization began in Britain. Uh, it didn't begin in the south. It began way up in the north against all odds. And then it kind of gradually went to Ireland and then south. And no one knows much uh, about anything apart from two little bits of information uh, about the people who built them. And I used that as a blueprint to try and get some information about the origin of these sites. And eventually through the etymology and the movement of DNA and the migration of people, the story ends up in Sardinia and the Armenian highlands. So if you need to know what the origin of the gods and the structures of Ireland and Scotland, uh, where they came from, you have to look in Sardinia and Armenia. And I had no idea the story was going to go that way. So, and the thing that connects them is the Anunnaki. So you had the lords of Anu. Uh, Anunnaki means people of Anu, or the sky god. Uh, within 3,000 years, they have moved around the Black Sea towards Romania and Bulgaria to create the uh, kingdom of Scythia. It's a huge kingdom that went all the way to Mongolia. And the Scythian people, their lords were called the Tuwa de Danu. So the Anu have now become something else, a uh, slightly different wording. They eventually gave name to the uh, big river that comes through the region, the Danube. Eventually, they get to Denmark. And by the time they've migrated to Ireland, they are called the Tuatha de Danan. So you see how the language moves with migration so that the Anunnaki begin uh, in the Armenian highlands. They become the two other Danu of Scythia. They eventually end up as the gods of Ireland. And that took place over a 6,000 year period. So you see how the story slowly migrates westwards towards that part of the world. So Sean Connery is Anunnaki. Is what Absolutely. you're saying. <laughs> Absolutely, Jimmy. <laughs> what a great show tonight, uh, Freddie. Thank you so much. And uh, I, we have to end it at some point. Uh, I don't want to. But uh, what a great conversation. And then uh, we'll uh, wrap things up in about uh, six weeks, and we'll come back and, and we'll do the Armenian Highlands. Absolutely, my friend. <laughs> Thank you so much, Freddie. I'll, I'll, we'll have, I hope you'll have a few more riffs to play us by then. You know what? Let's. Uh, we need to. This is what we're going to do. We're going to Skype and play guitar together off air. I better start practicing. I'll talk. To you. <laughs> That's the first time I've picked that thing up in two years. It didn't it look hates like me. man. It hates me. Freddie was. You know, Freddie's got the fingers. Freddie fingers. Thank you so it's much, called, Freddy. It's called throwing shapes. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy your night, man, and uh, great talking to you again and great hanging out with you this weekend. Be well, Jimmy. Thank you so much, Freddie. Freddie Silva, and the website is very simple. It is invisibletemple.com. We've got that up in all of social media and, of course, over on the website. All of his books, the blog, everything is there. Thank you so much, Freddie. Have a great night. And I uh, want to remind everybody, tomorrow night, John Greenwald is here. We've got a very, very interesting conversation. It's going to go down tomorrow night about that NSA document. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. 
Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldridge. Intro, Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJC for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2022 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black of the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with the Black Vault, John Greenwald, I want everybody to be safe. It's time to fade to black. Black.